And, and welcome back again to another episode of your favorite true crime and criminal culture podcast. Thought Riot Podcast. My name's Brendan. And I am Malia. Welcome to the show. And welcome to the show. So I think our new motto is going to be the people's podcast for Thought Riot Podcast. I thought it was, it, are you brave enough to think? That's the true crime talk show. The no, true, it yes, should be it flip-flopped. Oh, I don't think so. I think the podcast is determinate based on what people want to hear i know i pick my stories based off what people want to hear for thought right podcast the true crime talk show is more a continued conversation based on the stories from thought right podcast i still think it's flip-flopped but okay the people's podcast and plus the true crime talk show isn't a podcast Yes, it is. No, it's a talk show. Yeah, but it goes on all podcast platforms. Uh, I don't know about that. I like it how it is, but we'll figure it out. So welcome to, for now, Thought Riot Podcast, which is the people's podcast. And make sure you guys do all the normal podcast things. Hit that like button. Hit that comment. Hit that rating what else am i missing i don't know i'm just sure I'm do missing all things. the podcast things all the support you know leave a comment leave a rating just give us some love you know yeah. make sure you're following subscribing all of those things because they help out a ton like a lot a lot a lot we see a lot of times that a peop that people are watching us and they feel bad because they're not a member or they're not giving some kind of monetary uh, value to the show. And honestly, I think the most important thing is the likes and comments. Uh, more important than even the membership. The membership is something for viewers to gain for themselves, especially as we continue to add into that bucket. But uh, everything else, like, you know, it, all, all the... Everything else we just talked about is all for supporting the show. So, um, but it, yeah, it's what will grow the show the biggest. Yeah, 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 absolutely. So we commit to being honest, intelligent, unscripted, extra unscripted, and bringing interesting conversations and information we get and following it to wherever it leads, holding nothing back, sharing brutal honesty the entire time. Because we censor nothing. And talk about everything. <laughs> yeah. All right. So this week we uh, are starting late again and we're still stretched pretty thin. So we didn't do a uh, true crime content creator spotlight of the week. I just want to highlight a lot of the content creators that are supporting us right now. We have a lot of different content creators that hop in and out of our chats that so many of them that I, I'm not going to try to name them all because I'm going to forget somebody and I'm going to feel bad. Um, but we have a whole bunch of support from a whole bunch of other content creators. So this spotlight right here is for all of you guys. I think that what we're seeing when people are coming in and out of our chat is exactly what we've been hoping to see from the beginning. And, uh, you know, th there is nothing that's going to get solved as long as people are butting heads and there's drama and uh, all the negative things that come with it. You know, one of our focuses from the beginning has been on science do you, do you think you can go into a lab, like a science lab, and their main thing that they got going on is like gossip, drama, and everything else? Yeah, I highly doubt that. It, I don't think so. I don't think so. I just don't think it's conducive to 
uh, like a positive workspace when you're trying to investigate and figure out scientific topics, you know? I'm so, sure there may be some labs where that happens, but they probably have issues. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Like like some, you know, workplaces. But, um, but yeah, anyways, so we appreciate all of you. And this is a shout out to all of you, you know? Um, let's just keep doing what we're doing. And when people put their heads together, they create incredible things. So, yeah. Agreed. All right. So we are just going to go straight into the Thought Riot podcast breaking news of the week. Yeah. So starting off here, one thing that I saw people all over YouTube streaming, talking about, arguing about was the um, recent jury verdict on Jennifer Crumbly. Did you follow I have any of that? not. No. So this is in regards to Ethan Crumbly, the Oxford um, high shooting. Okay. Um, and it was a it was a it was a rough situation, you know, like this young 15 year old boy picks up a gun and goes in school and does what we've all heard too many times. Um, mm. And four students pass away. And there there's an incredible story in that where, like, I think she was a teacher um, literally confronted him face to face just to say try to save one of the kids and did not run. And he didn't do anything to the teacher, which was pretty incredible. But anyway, it's a horrible situation and something totally unprecedented happened, unprecedented happened, which is his mother and father were arrested for involuntary manslaughter due to them neglecting him and giving them some fault, some accountability, a burden to bear because their choices as parents were not good choices. Um, and they, the prosecution argued that that's ultimately what led Ethan to commit this crime. I think that's incredible. Well, there's been a lot of argument online and I, I honestly, I'm not, it depends. It, <clears throat> it depends on how this new precedent is used and this is the first time it's ever been done before, so I don't know how I feel about it. Like, I think if it is abused in the future, then yeah, that's going to be a problem. But as far as this particular case, I think the prosecution did a pretty good job painting the picture and showing really good evidence against her. Because from, from what I was hearing, like... Ethan wrote in his journals that he asked for mental health help, but his parents wouldn't listen to him, sending texts about having hallucinations. Um, and literally only days before the shooting, they bought him a gun at 15 and did not yeah. lock it up or secure it in any way. Yeah. And, and that is, look, I said that's incredible because I am a firm believer that in most of the majority uh, shooting situations that we've seen, um, it can be traced back to bad parenting. Now, understand that is not a one size fits all stamp. You know, right, it, right. It, it doesn't mean that happened. But the fact that they can charge parents when that is happening is what's nice. Not that every parent should be charged in every situation because there's nature versus nurture argument always, right? So I, I just want to be clear in me saying that doesn't mean that I'm like, yes, all parents need to be condemned because that happened. No, but if an investigation finds out that you were lacking as a parent, I... I think you should be. Yeah. I mean, it has to be more than just lacking. And I do feel like this was way more than just lacking. Um, it wasn't like, oh, I don't have enough time to hang out with my kid. It's like he has tons of cavities under his braces, like 11 or something like that. It's uh, he begs for mental health help and nobody helps him. Um, 
and among many things, many, many things. And I do feel like the parents' actions did lead to this. I think, you know, this boy was literally crying out for help. I think if he got help, this maybe wouldn't have happened, you know? And they literally bought him a gun. I Yeah, everything you're saying sounds to me like they are uh, or have some kind of accountability or fault there. So again, I feel like in this situation, at least, that uh, good, I'm glad this happened, you know? Yeah. Truly. I am glad this happened. So her husband's um, trial will be coming up. I meant to look that up to see when it will be coming. But um, I, I, the only thing with that is, I mean, clearly, like, the father took him to shooting ranges, and I, I think that I think that they're both probably in the same boat, but it does make me wonder, like with her trial having just happened uh, and being determined as guilty, how impartial can the next jury be? You know? Yeah. I, cause there's I been it. a lot of talk about that too. Like, what does that mean for the dad then? <clears throat> yep. I get it. I get it. However, look, I, I'm not against them being charged, convicted, managed the same way. Because if both of them were in the same household and this was going on, guess what? You're both to blame. Mm -hmm. It's that it's that simple. So I don't know if people are are drawing these issues out about the difference between the mom and the dad, and maybe it's not fair. Okay, uh, I mean I see too many reasons why they should be judged similarly. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure. I know that I know that I'm pretty sure it's scheduled, but it's going to be coming up anyway. And, um, you know, she faces up to 15 years for this, which I don't know. How do you feel about that? Do you think that's a lot? How many lives were lost? Four. Yeah. I think it's fair. Do you think it should be more? Um, I don't know. This is step one. So I, a lot of times asking me to commit to whether I think that's fair, whether I think it'll do good, I've got to be able to see the outcomes of these laws, right? Because every law and accountability within our justice system is done so with the intention of creating change and reducing these situations. So, um, is this going to be a case where it's going to help reduce these situations and make parents like realize I, I need to pay closer attention? You know, I need to be sure I need to. You know what I mean? Yeah. So I don't know how I feel. I'm not sure. Yeah, I, I think it's works. I think it's fair. Um, you know, I, I do. I think it's fair. Uh, but the sentencing hasn't happened yet. We don't know how much time she's going to get yet. Um, I, I've heard that they could count it as time served because she's already been in there a couple years. Um, but the prosecution obviously is going to want like the full, the full sentence. They're going to push for that. Lives were um, lost. Okay. This, this is not. A, a, this is not a parental mistake. Lives were lost. This is a mistake that is severe enough. Multiple lives were lost. Like, yeah, and they that's important. They, they, the prosecution at some points leaned on like the mother having an affair and things like that. None of that stuff matters. It's the fact that she knew something was wrong with him. She even admitted on the stand she knew he was depressed for months. And there's even a part where they say that when he asked for help, they laughed at him when he was talking about hallucinating. Like, I mean, it's it's just the sheer neglect. And, you know, I was listening to a mental health professional talk about neglect, and they said sometimes, like, some cases of neglect can be so bad that it's worse on the kid than physical abuse. Yeah. And... I that just struck me. I didn't oh, I didn't think I knew that. I didn't think about that. Like I 
neglect is so impactful. And they talked about how it makes you feel like almost less of a human, like you're not well, a human. Mental health. Mental health is so impactful that if physical trauma is never as severe as mental trauma. When uh, somebody is physically abused, let's say something that is really severe uh, with your mental health, let's say there was a sexual abuse, right? And it was very violent. Um, the the physical heals, you, you get over that, but it's the mental that is prolonged um, pain that you you have to actively go out of your way to try and correct so for me that's not surprising well i don't obviously the physical heals the the part of physical abuse is the mental part always yeah. um no matter what that is the part that's hard to get over um, is the mental aspect to it I, neglect but, specifically like i mean just our brains ignoring I your child yeah our, our brains identify with the physical aspects of anger, power, and control is where I was going. Not the obvious, like, uh, obviously, uh, physical injuries heal. But uh, we draw an easier connection with uh, physical abuse and understanding that. Because what ends up happening with mental mental health issues is a lot of times it prolongs it when we can't understand things like why we're the victim, why this person would do this to them in that nature. Like, you know what I mean? A lot of these open-ended questions that are, there aren't answers for, there are not answers for, uh, end up getting held on to. Yeah. But I just, I think it was really impactful. Uh, some of the things stated in there about neglect um, and the trial and how they didn't take care of him. And, you know, looking more into neglect, I realized like it, it's literally telling someone it's telling your child over and over. They're not good enough that they're not a person. They don't deserve even their basic needs or basic attention or love. And um, yeah, I think it can be on a developing brain who doesn't even understand these things could be a major problem in a kid's development. So, um, you know, the fact that all of this was going on with him for this long and then they bought him a gun. Yeah. I see them as like an accessory, <laughs> you know, to murder. So, um, I want to know what you guys think about it though. If you have a good argument to the contrary for or against the jury's verdict, let us know. Yes. All right. And uh, so I have an interesting one here, and it's not so much about the crime. It's more about the uh, social aspects of it. But uh, so uh, Daquan Slaughter, strange last name to be paired with a crime already, uh, 23, get this, was sentenced to 25 years for CP for child photographs that are not okay you know good i exactly but why i'm highlighting this story right now is because how many times have we talked about on here when we see child uh predators that are getting three years that are getting four years that are getting five years and getting out and 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 the the uh, reconviction rates. You mean reoffending? The, the reoffending rates are like upwards of seventy percent or more. Oh, it's more than seventy. Yeah, it, the last one I looked at, they're all over the place. There's no it, part of that issue that the the argument that's out there around predators is that um, most of them aren't honest obviously, right? So they can never get a good statistical number around reoffenders, and because they're not going to come out and be like, oh yeah, I, I did it again. You know, I just didn't get caught. Nobody really knows what it is, but they know it's high enough where most of the uh, articles or um, papers or, or whatever can confidently show that it's above 70%. So um, we've just been calling for harsher 
accountability around these crimes. And this is where we're starting to see it. So this happened in Illinois. It said the case was involved in the Illinois Attorney General's Internet Crimes Against Children Task Force and the Illinois State Police. Um, they had a warrant to search his house, got in there, and uh, he got caught with a whole bunch of photos, uh, computer images and everything and they hit him with 25 years good i agree i think it's really good and i mean it's easy to just be like even with the story that you were just talking about it's easy to be like yeah i agree you know let's stick it to him but like the social implications are really important with these topics because the reason I talk about them is to try and make sure that it doesn't continue to happen, right? So in order for these things to change, there has to be change. And these little peddly little two, three-year sentences clearly weren't doing anything because the uh, the rates around predators were increasing, not decreasing. So to see a task force and a state and, uh, you know, the, the attorney general's office come in swinging with a 25 year sentence for photographs. I'm, I'm really happy about me too. It, it could, I think there, I think a lot of people could look at this and be like, Whoa, 25 years, a life sentence for, uh, pictures. Yeah. But when you actually understand the probabilities of somebody that is even willing to engage in the type of activities that have to do with uh, pictures, child pictures in that way, the they are uh, taking part in a growing criminal underground of all things that involve children. Yeah, they're, they are co-signing abuse. They are literally engaged in it. They are. They are supporting it. It's not just pictures. It is not. No. The, no. the places you have to go to to get those pictures. And it's not just pictures. The places you have to go to and how the pictures were taken. Like, dude, you know, it, it's just. It's uh, sick. It is. It is. It's disgusting. So. On uh, on February 5th of 2024, Slaughter pleaded guilty to the charges against him. He honestly probably thought he was going to get one of those smaller sentences. I almost guarantee it, you know, for pleading guilty. Uh, just four days later, he was sentenced to 25 years in prison. This sentence serves as a stark reminder of the severe consequences awaiting those who engage in such uh, abhorrent activities. It also underscores the commitment of law enforcement agencies to combat these crimes and ensure justice is served. We we need to stop the war on drugs completely and have a war on something like this. I, I don't think we should have a war on anything. <laughs> I don't. I don't. It just further continues the militarization of the police and like it, we need something different than that because like, okay, if we did transition to a war on predators in this way, right? Um, while I support that focus on predators, I don't support militarization of police. So while you're going to catch probably more predators for sure, uh, how many other people are going to be wrongly convicted because of that? You know what I mean? There's going to be there's there's got to be a fair middle ground you know how many people were wrongly convicted uh because of the war on drugs i get i guarantee you it's an insurmountable uncountable number it has ruined our police in all areas not just drug charges in all charges it's a dangerous thing to have your police militarized. Yeah. I don't agree with the militarization of police, but um, I just think there needs to be more done nationwide. Like you have certain jurisdictions that are local that really like that one. Um, it's a county in Florida 
that they always are going after, you know, predators and trafficking people and stuff like that. And they're always posting their press conferences, like showing all the people that they've caught. Mm -hmm. Um, and they, they have some special task force or something that does it. Um, I just wish there was more of an effort nationwide instead of just like local to certain counties. Yeah, I agree with you. It says the story of Daquan slaughter is a chilling reminder of the darker side of the digital age. As technology continues to evolve, it is crucial that society remains vigilant in protecting its most vulnerable members. The sentence handed down to slaughter sends a clear message. Such heinous crimes will not be tolerated and will be met with the full force of the law. Bam. But I'm curious how you guys feel about it. Let me know what you think in the comments below. So, Rex Hewerman has been isolated in jail for his own safety. And he's depressed. He's very depressed. That's I'm surprised they even and lonely posted that story. Well, it was in the court hearing that was just what? recently happened. Yeah, what were this they past arguing? Tuesday. Um, they want mental health help for him. Yeah, I'm sure all your victims were lonely too. And look, I I understand he's not convicted yet. Like, I get it, okay? But there are cases out there that you can hang your hat on. And if you have read the 1,200 pages or more, it's more, but at at least 1,200 pages of this arrest warrant and document, uh, documenting the evidence against Rex Hewerman, Oof, you guys. Yeah, so he is getting counseling, um, and I don't know if he's asking to be let out into general population or something. Good luck. Because he's in isolation for his own safety, um, and the lawyer just brought that up. There is no... There is no uh, camera recording of the proceedings, so it's not like I know exactly what the lawyer said, except for what was reported in articles by reporters that were there. Um, And they that's all they really said is that his lawyer, Michael Brown, brought up that the isolation is making him feel lonely and depressed and he's getting counseling. And that's it. Mm -hmm. Um, And this is also coming after um, humanizes him. (laughs) Yeah. I almost wonder if that was the goal. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because people are seeing him as an ogre. Like a murderous ogre. I mean, look. And he is. Yeah. Based off the evidence. (laughs) He's a monster. He absolutely is. And I think he's a true sociopath. So can he be depressed in the same ways that a normal human can? Or is this a ploy uh, from the defense to reduce the possibility of, uh, wait, I don't think they do death penalty there. I don't think it's a death penalty state, right? I, I don't, don't think, think so. so. Yeah. Um, so is there some way he's at the age, there's no way he's going to get out. Even if he had a 20 year sentence or something like that, like he's probably going to pass in there. Um, but, uh, there's so, so I don't much, know. there's I don't so know. much evidence. There is no way he's getting away with this. There is no way. The only way I could see any sort of reduced sentencing at all is if he turned fed and helped point out any officers that were involved if they were able to find actual evidence of officer involvement. That is the only way I could see this man getting any sort of reduction. You know, what's also interesting is that the woman who wrote the affidavit um, that was about the swinger party and mm-hmm. seeing Karen Vergata running, she did an interview on Banfield and came forward and, and actually showed her face and talked about it all. And I thought that wow. was crazy. Like the interview was pretty good. Um, 
I was I was just very surprised by that. Um, but she, I feel like hearing it from her was interesting. Like yeah. actually hearing it from her talking about it. Yeah. And uh, her boyfriend and everything, and the way she explained it, it just more makes like that. You know, they went there, which I didn't realize this when we read the affidavit. They went there in one car, and when they left, they left in a different car. Meaning he had a good relationship with Hewerman. Yeah, that's strange. They left in a different car. Very strange. Isn't it? Mm-hmm. Yeah. There's but also like been, I said, I think that's the only way. John Ray also did a symposium, uh, which I haven't got to watch all of, and the audio's rough. But there's more affidavits now from more women and ones even of him when he was younger, like stalking her behind a tree while she went for a jog. Oh, I mean, that doesn't surprise me. The lengths that he went to, like Rex Hewerman didn't get caught for a very long time because he was, you know, checking his P's and Q's. He was. And uh, he had some kind of connection somehow in some way. Yep. Mm hmm. But um, they also d uh, turned over new DNA evidence uh, because he was, I guess we haven't updated on this part of the case yet, but he has been charged with the fourth murder um, of Marine Bernard Barnes. Mm -hmm. Um which is the one that everyone, everybody's been waiting for. Like, when are they finally going to charge him with the fourth? Um, well, there's just crazy new details that honestly, it'd probably be worth looking into and talking about further with all the new it, hair and everything. There are a lot of new details. And I mm -hmm. thought about covering it as a case tonight, you guys, but I have uncovered so many new details that I, I literally, it's going to take a while for me to formulate all of it because there are there's some insane information out there now, and I'm not talking just the forensic evidence with the hairs and the DNA. There is a lot more out there. I know. Um, and it's wild stuff. Uh, but they turned over 3,000 police tips and a bunch of documents, um, DNA evidence in this court case. Um, I, the 3,000 tips is interesting. <laughs> <laughs> I'm curious what they're going to find in there. Um, they also talked about, you know, what's interesting is I keep hearing a co-defendant or like being mentioned. In a press conference after the court hearing, his, uh, his attorney came out and he hinted towards another person. Hmm. Well, all right. I so... I don't know who, how is it going to end up being his wife? Is it going to end up being that other guy that we're hearing about? Like what, what is it going to end up being? Right. Mm. I'm really curious because I've been hearing a lot of chatter for a long time that people believe there's a ring of these people in that area. Um, and I, I'm Really starting to think there's something to that. I did kind of think there was something to that when you mentioned the search results, mm. his Google search history. And you're yep. like, how does he know that video's out there? Yeah, He is so specific. He had to already know that was out there, meaning there's probably a ring of these sickos, you know? Mm -hmm. So, and with the uh, 11 other victims, which honestly, all of them pretty much fit his MO too. But maybe it's that group's MO. Could be. So, I don't know. I just wanted to talk about it because I thought it was interesting. And boo-hoo, Rex Hurman is depressed. Yeah. Poor guy. <laughs> just kidding. But let me know what you guys think. If there's anything specific that you have seen about the Gilgo case that you want me to dive deeper into, let me know. But other than that, Next week, be expecting a really deep dive into some interesting, like, satellite cases that could be Rex Hewerman and new details that I was blown away by. Yeah, I'm excited for it. But, uh, 
All right, diving back into the Kansas City 3. We have now done like two breaking news updates, one full case uh, into the Kansas City 3. Now, uh, this came out and was posted February 2nd, and it says Kansas City Area Police Departments are sounding the alarm after toxicology reports showed three men had fentanyl and cocaine in their systems when they were found dead in the Northland last month. The Independence Police Department said it had seen an astronomical rise in cases involving fentanyl, while the Kansas City, Kansas Police Department said the rise is steady and alarming. So, and I started digging into this a little bit. It's not only that, they're talking about the strength of this fentanyl that's hitting their streets. It is they're sounding the alarms in this area because the amount of fentanyl deaths that they're seeing is rising in this area. And like we've talked about this quite a bit, but why I want to talk about it again is because I don't. If there's any way, if there's somebody that watches us, right, that that uses things recreationally, uses them addictively, it doesn't matter. Like Anything no, you buy off the street. Yeah, and there's no judgment. No. Nope. But it's important to highlight these things to prevent this from possibly happening to somebody else. And I use this example a lot. I believe it was Arizona, but I don't have it pulled up in front of me. Um, but uh, there was this girl, you can look it up, that lost her life um, because she bought an Adderall, what she believed was an Adderall. She was a college student. And uh, she took a quarter of it to, to study that night and died. A quarter, a quarter of what she thought was a prescribable pill and died because of fentanyl in it. So um, the strength of the fentanyl, you guys, is, is, is wild. And we it's did horrible. a premiere. It is. And, and it could be so much stronger. There's this, there's this mathematical value of like how many times stronger fentanyl is than morphine. But when it's coming from a black market uh, lab, you don't know what's being mixed in there. You don't know if they have their chemical composition correct in making fentanyl. You don't know any of it. You don't know if you could be buying cocaine that has 90% fentanyl in it and 10% cocaine because there is so much fentanyl out right now. It is being pushed so heavily everywhere that fentanyl is now cheaper than cocaine is. So if you're a cocaine dealer and you have a bag of fentanyl and you're wanting to make that cocaine last longer, it's really easy to add something cheaper to it. So... This whole story is really sad. I don't know if we're going to be seeing the chemist, which is the friend that was alive in this whole story. Uh, we don't know if we're going to see some kind of charges brought to him. He ended up going to rehab. We talked about it in our case video that just premiered a few days ago. So check it out. But um, he's in rehab, which puts him under HIPAA. The police cannot go and you know, get statements from him or anything else. We don't know if there's going to be anything else to it. We don't know if they were all victims of it. And the chemist tends to have a tolerance or, or had a tolerance. So he's the only one that lived. We don't know. But it, I think another thing to highlight here too is if all four of them did it, right, it's really important to to highlight that the chemist, the guy, I, I wish I had his name up. It's Jordan something. His name's Willis. Jordan, Jordan Willis. Okay. The chemist is Jordan Willis. It's important to note that all four of them could have done it. And if Jordan Willis had uh, a tolerance, he could have nodded out and his friends could have died and he would have no idea. Yeah. So he's, None. he's not actually a chemist. He's a scientist that researches <laughs> HIV Data drugs. Scientist. Uh, HIV drugs. Um, he, the nickname is the chemist because he used to mix cocktails of drugs in high school, you know, partying 
Um, that's how we got the nickname. But um, yeah, I was actually thinking about that. Is you know they could have done this cocaine, and it could have had just a little bit. Like it could literally just have a little bit of fentanyl in it, and they could have all died, and he could have technically actually OD'd but survived and was just nodded out yep. because he has a tolerance. Like, I don't know how often this guy is using cocaine from this dealer that may have little bits of fentanyl in it, or maybe he is an opiate addict. Um, we just don't know, but clearly he has some kind of addiction that he went to rehab for and didn't realize his friends were outside all that time. So it does make me think... We don't know that for sure yet, but not for where, sure. where we're going is it would be very easy for that to happen. And I do feel like he could not notice his friends outside, especially yeah. if he's a user, especially if he, yep. his job is in front of a computer. I can't, my job's in front of a computer and the editing for the podcast. I can't tell you how many times I'll get in front of a computer. Then all of a sudden a day goes by and another one and another one. And you've just been working the entire time. It's really easy to lose track of time and stuff. So, it, you know, if he's not a smoker that goes out back or like his trash cans aren't out back or he has a dog that he lets out back to pee. Uh, why would he go out? He back? does have a dog. And that's part of the issue with his story is that it's changed several times and he claimed that he took the dad to his dad the dad the dog to his dad's house and he never went to go get him over those that weekend or a few days after that which is odd like why did you need to take him to your dad's and why did you leave him there for days um there is a doggy door that the dog can go in and out of the house by itself so, I mean, the, there could his, be story, a fair... his story has changed a few times. And honestly, what I have to say about it is there's no benefit, even if he was afraid to call the police because he was afraid of getting in trouble. Because I've seen it happen. I've seen people OD and everybody takes off running. You know, I've seen it because people have gotten charged with this before. Um even if that was the case where he was afraid to call anybody, what's the benefit of leaving them in the backyard and doing nothing about it? Yeah, I, no, I, I you're agree. gonna get caught eventually. People are gonna come looking for these three men eventually. The only thing that I could come up with is maybe he is such a serious addict that he had a big bag of dope and like kept going at it Binged. like yeah i i don't want to think about this you know take a little bit not out i don't want to think about this take a little bit not out and all of a sudden days have gone by i don't know i Maybe. just don't know that's a plausible theory um you know ad addicts don't make sense in the way that they make their decisions nope. and the only thing that matters is the drug and there is a it, it has nothing to do with them as a person their their brain literally feels like it needs it obviously there are ways around that and you can detox and figure out how to cope and get over those things but when you're in active addiction and you have physical withdrawals and everything your brain believes it needs it more than air like for those of you that have never looked at that rat study where they gave rat drugs okay cocaine I, I, cocaine but they also did other drugs too i'm pretty sure it was across the board um it, if the rat had to choose between food and water or cocaine, uh, it picked the cocaine every time to death. Yeah, till it to died. To its death. So, like, those, and that's natural instinct, okay? Yeah, for humans, too. Yeah. Yep. So, interesting, right? I think it's, I think it's interesting. And I think there could be a logical, uh, innocent reason, but... That is strange. Yeah, there's so many addicts who are like so thankful to be alive. You yeah. know, they're like, that's the one thing they're thankful for. It's like, I don't know how I'm alive, but I'm super thankful I am. Yeah. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. because it, you're, it's a death sentence. Yeah. So, but yeah. But, um, you know, there, there is some rumbling out there uh, that 
people believe or or have some some evidence that there was a U-Haul truck there and they believe that he was actually making the fentanyl. Now understand, the, there's I have not seen anything to substantiate that. But I want to be able to bring it up because that is our motto, you know. Um and uh there are some people out there believe that he was more than just maybe a user, maybe he was helping cut uh, or something of that nature and that's why the dog's gone that's why he was starting to move furniture out that's why he moved out of his house so quick like well you know what's interesting is if he were handling these drugs regularly to distribute them or cut them just it coming into contact with your skin or little bits of dust in the air can make you build a tolerance cuz it can make you literally od yeah. but you can build a tolerance to where he maybe wouldn't have died. Maybe when his maybe. friends came over to party and he gave them all a line. Maybe I'm curious what you guys think though. Maybe. There's a lot of possibilities here and a lot of question marks left uh, unanswered. One thing I will say is from all accounts, it seems like the police have been doing a good job. So um, that's awesome. And yeah. I hope that we just get more answers here because what an awful situation these guys had family members i believe uh two of them had kids right yeah um and uh one fiance like just an awful situation an it awful situation and you know fueled by dope which ugh, yeah but none of, it seems that it seems that none of the three were active drug users like yeah they partied sometimes but which they weren't sense, addicts though. or drug users which makes sense why those guys were the ones that died playing yep. with such a seriously strong uh chemical drug you know yeah it could have just been for old time's sake get a bag of coke you know it goes well with alcohol and then bam yeah but it's lace because of the world we live in today yep but let me know what you think so, um, I saw this headline and I was like, wait, what? Um, six people presumed dead after a Pennsylvania home was set on fire and two police officers were shot. What? Yeah. What? I don't know. So, um, I don't know why this happened, but the more I looked into it, I found out who police believed did it. But going into, like, what happened, so um, at the time that this first came out, which was today, February 9th, but there's already an update to it, um, they said six people were unaccounted for and presumed dead after the home set on fire. And the police officers responding to the scene were immediately fired upon and two were shot. And there were multiple jurisdictions Whoa. that arrived to the scene. So there was like three police um, departments okay. that sent yep. officers to the okay. scene. Yep. Three different police yep. offices. Yep. So they went, it was, uh, they were called to an East Lansdowne home around 3.45 p.m. on Wednesday after the 911 call. Uh, they got a 911 call saying an 11-year-old girl had been shot. Um, like I said, they all arrived and immediately were getting shot at. And the two officers survive, like they're believed to survive. They they're in the hospital, um, which I can't even imagine. You show up and just immediately it's raining gunfire, and the house is getting set on fire. It sounds like madness. This is a chaos. whole. It is chaos. And look at the picture. Yeah. So the. This was a whole family annihilated. Two parents and three kids. Dad. So who's the six, right? Yeah. Well, it was the uncle. And he is presumed to be the one who did all of it. And I don't know why. Mm. Which is insane. Like, when I think about a family dynamic... How does an uncle fit in that he commits murder to the whole family like that? I don't know. 
Like, what are you doing, guy? The only thing I could think of is some sort of psychotic break. Remember when we did uh, the video comparing the difference between uh, the Idaho 4 Brian Koberger uh, stabbing and the uh what was it boston or it, it was a new in the new york area but this other guy had a quadruple homicide as well using uh the steak knife or whatever done in similar time yep. and everything and he was uh associated with that family similarly to what like an uncle or a cousin or something of that nature and they they've been trying to help him out but he was not mentally stable and they were trying to get him out of the house. And one day he just flipped, man, he turned and uh, tried to end everybody there. So is it a situation like that where, you know, the mental health of this person hadn't been managed properly or they can't even ask him why, because all of them are dead. They all oh, went down. Including. Yeah. Oh, so the six body, uh, one of the adult bodies had a rifle with it. And as I said, it's a family of five and there's a six body that has a rifle next to it. Got it. So it was the uncle. Mm. Um, but yeah, it, so the, the three children were 17, 13 and 10. And the That's uncle was, sad. um, they named the, so we, do, I, I'm assuming it's still speculation, but they believe it was the uncle, um, Ken Lee, the, he's 43 years old, um, and brother of their father. I just, here's pictures of all of them. Yeah, that's sad. It's really yeah. sad. It is really sad. But what I don't understand is why did they say an 11-year-old girl was shot? None of the children were 11. And the girl is the oldest, I thought. I don't know. Could it have been some sort of mistake? Or is there something more nefarious going on there? Or, you know... Like what, he called the cops there just to shoot him? I mean, when I'm thinking nefarious, I'm thinking nefarious enough. I don't want to share my idea. Just make the connection, you guys. An 11-year-old random girl and an older man, you know? Was there something going on that sparked to this? I, I don't know. Hmm. Or was that 11-year-old girl just a family friend and was hanging out with the kids when this madness started? I, I don't know. Yeah, so it sounds like the family is still um, awaiting information Awful. from the investigation. Uh, I don't think really anybody knows what was going on. It, it's literally they literally said it was chaos. Like the whole scene was just chaos. It none of it made any sense. So, um, what is going on? No, yeah, I have like. My fingers aren't working right now, but I don't know. I'm, I'm waiting to know. Like, I'm really curious. This update came really fast after they recovered the bodies, like literally reported in the same day who did it. Um, cause it was a mystery at first. Like what happened here? You know, I don't, and nobody knew. Mm. Um, and this just came out cause I was reading it and I was like, Whoa, like how did this happen? And then I found that article about it being the uncle and it was literally just posted. Um, so I'm really curious to find out why this happened. And, you know, there's several accounts by family and neighbors saying, you know, it was a really great family, like a really loving family. The kids were really sweet and quiet and, you know, were, did good in school and they're adorable. So it just doesn't really make sense. Yeah. Sad. Sad. But stuff. anyway, um, maybe it was just a mental break. I don't know. Hopefully we'll be able to find out more. Yeah. In the investigation. Because they're also assuming it was the uncle. Like, what if it wasn't? How do they know that if everybody got burned up in the fire? Yeah. Yeah. But let me know what you guys think. It's a tragic breaking news story. Yeah. 
feel really bad for the family. Internet sleuths are so dangerous. Wait, what? Sleuths are super dangerous? Yeah, says uh, the cyber sleuth, the Idaho murders, which began streaming on February 6th. So this is what I wanted to do, you guys. I want to talk about this, okay? And I intentionally wanted to talk about it just with like, Doing a little bit of an a uh, little bit of a background read into the topic and what's going on with it and everything like that before I watch it. Okay, so interesting. Cyber Sleuths premieres on Paramount Plus. It is uh, now. This is interesting. So total total play and manipulation here. Because when I first saw it, I was like, hmm. it already did premiere. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was like, hmm. Uh, who? Why have you watched it? No. Okay, so. Uh, I was like, huh, who who are they maybe talking about? You know, who who do they include here? And uh, I don't know. It doesn't show it. But when I when I started digging into it, it highlights like, you know, the don't F with cats uh, documentary that was on Netflix. It also talks about uh, Max's. They called him mostly harmless, which that was solved by an uh, by an Internet sleuth as well. Um, and then it goes into the Idaho four. But what's interesting is they call it cyber sleuths, the Idaho murders. But all they're talking about is TikTok sleuths. So what's the difference? I I don't know. What is a tick? What is the problem with a TikTok sleuth or an internet sleuth? Uh, I don't know. I have no idea. You know what's interesting and and. We're going to talk a little bit about Get a Clue tonight in a different story. But, you know, one of Get a Clue's pet peeves is the whole misinformation, disinformation thing. You know what I mean? I, I'm only assuming that maybe that's the focus here. Um, I That's my guesstimate before I go into it, that that's going to be their angle. Because, it, like... This is why Get a Clue hates misinformation, though, is because, you know, he feels like... It discredits everyone's work. Like I, if you want to actually do good work, then spreading misinformation that you barely thought about, like or didn't vet, uh, is just okay. But you want the truth. It's just um, like disqualifying anything you have to say. Okay, but you want the truth. What the truth is, every single word that comes out of every single person ma- person's mouth should be considered as misinformation, misinformation or disinformation. We've already dug into the fact that facts are subjective. Everyone's. I don't think people understand the scope of the meaning of that. It means every single thing that comes out of every single person's mouth, unless it is verified by objective backing data of said statements or information, is false until proven otherwise. That's why I I don't buy in. I, I don't. I have nothing wrong with it. I'm not judging it, but I don't care about misinformation or disinformation. In my world, everything is misinformation and disinformation, and it continues to be that until proven, so I just don't have any expectations to be, like, let down. You know what I mean? So, I mean... Even science is disinformation because it evolves. And once it evolves and it turns into the next level with some kind of different correlating uh, background evidence, then all the science before it is now misinformation. So I I don't see the same issues as Get a Clue. I respect his opinion, of course. Um, And we all have different opinions, but I'm assuming that's going to be the angle here just because of the statement that says in parentheses, they are not qualified. Okay. That argument, that is so ridiculous. Mm. I think the real issue is um, not everybody is like an actual sleuth. Like there are people out here who are talking about it because they're interested in it. I mean, that I doesn't make I them a sleuth. I myself a sleuth. Me neither. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, people just I because into science, not investigation. So science is investigating. Yeah, I mean, 
I don't know if I agree with your whole thing about everything being misinformation. I think that um, there should be some kind of backing or tying. So, like, if I if I'm going to talk about something, if I don't have a way to tie it into reality, then I'm going to say I don't have a way to tie it into any kind of reality. Yeah. I um, and obviously, we're all human, and we we make human error, and uh, we don't mean to like. Even if we're on here and we say something that we realize later is not true, that doesn't like everybody does that. Even with the best Which intentions, does it? Point. Even if um, you know you have some kind of study backing what so you're saying, and then you find out the study has major issues, um, like we find out about tons of studies over the years, and then you realize, wow, that was not ever true, and I lived my life by that, you know? Yes, and what's interesting like is reuse, I feel like... Like reuse and recycle. Where does all your plastic go in a landfill? Yeah, I, I feel like there is, like, somebody that would care seriously about, like, the misinformation, disinformation versus someone that wouldn't is someone that is more optimistic looking at a situation versus someone that's more pessimistic or questioning of situations because uh, every single bit of disinformation or misinformation that comes out, I don't believe they're doing it with harmful intent. I believe that they have good intent uh, and I believe that they believe they're giving facts. So why am I going to judge someone for that? That is absolutely absurd. Absolutely it's different, absurd. It's different lifestyles. Like, you know, some people are just more cynical about things than others. And I mean, some, some people are just like that. And I mean, it is what it is. It's their choice to live that way. Other people are eternal optimists like you who, you know, nothing anybody can say dampens your parade, you know? <laughs> Yeah. So, I mean, it's it's your outlook. It's your perspective. It's the way you think about these things. Um, I think disqualifying sleuths through this, um, saying that it's like some danger or something like it's absurd. I don't, I, it is absurd yeah. because, you know, the real sleuths, like the ones who solved these cases, they found the information and they turned it over to the cops. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And and you know what they're asking people to do to not care about their communities, to not care about society, to not care about other people, to not care right. about their justice system. It is absurd. OK, they uh, misinformation and disinformation and gossips and 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 uh, the knitting circles and tea parties and all these things like. This is nothing new to humanity. It's just on they're the internet. To make it pro they're trying to make it seem like it's new, a new problem. It's not a new problem. Oh, that's a good point. It like, has forever <laughs> been a problem. Yeah. As long as human beings have been around, <laughs> this stuff has been a problem. This is nothing new, okay? But this is what's interesting. I have a really interesting question okay. here. So the person doing the interview here says, and... This is the interviewer, and the response is the creator of this uh, docuseries. He says, did you have any desire to wait for the Koberger trial to start before releasing this series? That way, you could have determined if the sleuths in your series are right in any way. So, like... He's openly offering potentially misinformation, disinformation. What? what What if these TikTok sleuths are right? Okay. Okay. He's putting down tics, TikTok sleuths, specifically that he, Brian Koberger, could be innocent. He's saying that's toxic, dangerous, and should be stopped. What if Koberger is found innocent? Yeah, it's kind of stupid. He's literally doing the exact thing that he's complaining about. Yeah. It's ridiculous. And he says, I feel like this case was the entry point to a story about the TikTok true crime generation. So when we were pitching the series, the outcome of the case was always irre irrelevant. What? 
Are you serious? Insane. Yeah, I don't I don't even watch TikTok to true crime. Hardly ever. Like I mean, the I think this is I've seen some incredible stuff on TikTok though. I think this is a door opening to condemn everybody that's involved. Yeah, but what is the point of focusing on TikTok? I don't I, understand it. What's the point in focusing on cyber sleuths when you have story after story after story after story of successes, when you have uh, America's Most Wanted that has the best stats nationally? Like, you have no evidence for this. So you're complaining for what? Where is your evidence that cyber sleuths are bad? Because you don't like them? Because the police don't like them? Because they can't handle being called out? Like, okay, Good point. it's absurd. It is absurd. I I can't think of any cyber sleuth that has actually hindered an investigation in any way. No, not one story. If they did, they would be charged. Exactly. With our militarized police that we have right now, they would be charged. Yeah, they would. So wild. And if but- they did, I, I, they were probably had some kind of mental health issue. It's probably the problem. They probably weren't like the sluice I know of. It may be. I, I don't know. I am a believer in our rights as citizens. Okay. I think anybody's allowed to say anything. I don't think that they should be stopped. Even if what they're saying is untrue, you're going to what successfully shut down every comedian that's ever going to come on the stage because everything they say is mainly untrue and subjective and intentionally twisted. Like there's a line. What we don't get to tell people what they can or can't say, whether it's true or not. It's your job to figure out if you believe what they're saying based on the evidence that you can find. It is not the person that's talking's job to stop talking. It's our jobs to stop listening. Just my opinion, but. Yeah. You know, I agree with that. But I'm curious looking at this now, I, I'm going to be going into it right with a bias that I feel like it's ridiculous already. I don't even need to hear. I don't need to see how ridiculous the TikTok true crimers are. I, I'm sure whichever ones they highlight truly are going to be so insanely ridiculous. I'm sure. I'm sure they picked like people that could appear off their rocker based on how they shot it and the things they said because that is... They included the Chronicles of Olivia. No way. Yeah. Oh, wow. Okay. Um. So, no. Not completely. Well, I don't know who all is included. I just only know the Chronicles of Olivia was included. That's all I know. I'm curious to see what comes out of this, though. I am really curious. I'm excited to to watch it. I hope it's juicy. Yeah. So I can laugh. (laughs) Yeah. I just I just hope people. Are objective, scientifically focused enough to see the uh, logical fallacies in this already, like very clear logical fallacies where anytime you have a binary system where one side saying you're doing something wrong and the other side saying, no, you're doing something wrong. They're both doing something wrong. Like you're both doing something wrong because you both are believing in the logical fallacy that if I'm right, therefore they can, they have to be wrong. Actually, both sides can be right. Both sides can be wrong. It could land somewhere in the middle. It, it, there are no binary systems except for computer coding. You know, that's the only binary system there is. So it's the world we live in today. You know, these sewing circles where people gossip, they used to be in the private of some grandma, like the privacy of some grandma's house. Yeah. Now it is on the internet for everyone to watch and we just have to not care if people talk about us or not care if somebody said something that's blatantly false. Um, you know, you have a voice to speak up and say what you want to say too. Yeah. I and agree. it's, you know, you should do that if you feel like it's necessary and um verify all information. That's why we always say, don't believe us, do your own research. Uh, that's why we don't call ourselves sluice either because we're just here to talk about it and present what we find. Like we're not trying to, I don't know. I feel like sleuth almost implies hacker. Am I wrong? 
in that. Yeah, yeah. Sleuth, sleuth is uh, investigator. Yeah. Not hacker. But I, some of the sleuthing stories I've heard where they actually like I mean, caught people, they, they sure. kind of go into that territory a little bit. Uh, I I don't know about that. I I'm not trying to give anybody fuel because I don't think that's what it is. Um, the the person that that figured out why uh, don't you just call yourself a PI and not a sleuth? The, the person that identified um that case, the they called him mostly harmless. She put up a um a self funded um. Like what's it called? Where you can donate money or whatever. A, GoFundMe. Uh, a, I don't think it was a GoFundMe, but it was GoFundMe. Like, um, she put that out there. Uh, got enough funding to run a private DNA testing sample, and she was able to identify this victim because the police wouldn't do that. That is a sleuth. There, that is yeah. an investigator. That's yeah. an investigator that started online. That's where and sleuth it, comes from. Yeah. If you're an online investigator, yes, it it definitely can uh, transition into real life too. Like a civilian investigator is what a yep. sleuth is. Yep. Yeah. Yep. It is because they care about their their citizens because they care about their community and their justice system and honestly i'm here to say that i don't care what anyone says we need more people like that not less yeah no i more. i agree with you now i feel dumb even talking about hacking i'm just thinking of a particular story i guess <laughs> that's what's yeah. well in my head you're thinking of don't f with cats where they reached out so the ones that started all the interest into the don't f with cats case was hackers because this guy was abusing cats and these hackers, white hack hackers, like they love, everyone loves their animals. How dare you for abusing a cat? We're going to hack your coding and figure out where your GPS background data and location is so that we can find you and stop you, you know? And in that situation, that is a white hat hacker using black hat techniques, uh, which if you guys don't know, white hat is like, uh, a good hacker, just as simple as it can be. A black hat's a, a bad hacker, right? Um, so they hacked into certain systems as metadata, as computer, things like that to locate him and stop animals from being hurt. Like, I take my hat off to those people. Good. Your white hat off? Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, no, that's amazing. I, I, If I knew how to do that, I would do it. But yeah. I'm curious what you guys think, and uh, I'm going to watch it here soon, and we'll see what We should happens. have a movie night, some popcorn. Yeah. yeah and absolutely. watch it. It's going to be interesting. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and that is it for this week's True Crime Breaking News. Of the week. Thought Riot style. Bam. Number one tonight. We are going to get back into the drama, but not really, because we don't really talk about drama here. This whole topic, I just feel like, has been a whole bunch of drama. and Because everyone know, wants to say they said it first. <laughs> right. And you know what's weird is... Uh, I was, I'm not going to put anyone on blast. I, I won't put anyone. I just won't do that. I won't do that ever for anybody. Uh, it's just not the motto of thought, right? Podcast, but I was, uh, talking with somebody and, uh, you know, I, I had made some comments that this information had been sent to me like a long time ago. And, uh, I, I don't think People involved in this drama liked the fact that I said that uh, and, you know, it, it ended up getting removed and some things like that. That That's my assumption I'm coming to. But uh, I got to be honest here. I don't. I'll give whoever wants to take credit. Go right ahead. I'm not I'm not interested in credit. I, I will. 
happily never say that I saw it six months ago ever again because it just doesn't matter to me. Um, what matters to me personally is just like progressing the knowledge and science behind it. Um, There's a reason we never claim credit for anything. No, I also don't race for things. And I'm not trying to fly my flag of how great am I? You know what I mean? It's just not the goals of the podcast. Not because... Nope. Not because there's something wrong with content creators out there that do want to come out with it first. That's great. Um, but science is not quick a lot of times. Yeah. And I I want to lean on science as much as possible here. So um we just made it a goal right from the beginning that we're not gonna we're not gonna join that race. When the info comes to us and we look into it, then we're gonna look into it, you know, and I'm gonna do it as thorough as possible. And another interesting thing here is everyone that's talked about this, which you guys will probably know what we're talking about already, but every single one of those people are probably going to hate me at the end of this video. That's a strong statement. Yeah, obviously I am. Uh, I'm exaggerating a little bit, <laughs> I think, but okay. I'm going to start it off with the bang statement here. All right. Um, this whole experiment needs to be thrown out the window. All of it. What the experiment? Whole thing, the whole experiment that everyone's leaning on that has to do with the brass button and the sheath. It's flawed. The whole thing, okay? We made a comment, and I want to clarify some things before we actually get into the science of it. What's going on, Thought Riders? So, I realized during editing, I did not make a smooth transition into talking about what this science experiment actually is. So I'm hopping in your video here to explain what it is for our podcast viewers that aren't on the true crime talk show with us. The science experiment we're talking about is uh, titled Trace DNA and its persistence on various surfaces, a long-term study investigating the influence of surface type and environmental conditions, part one, metals. Essentially what it's going through is uh, how DNA uh, breaks down on different metal types. And uh, it, 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 it does a very long-term study uh, of, I think it's like, 10, 7, 8, 10, something different metal types. Uh, but uh, the most important one we're talking about here is going to be brass, right? Because uh, brass is what was involved in the Idaho 4 crime. So back to your show. We started talking about this last night, You're not, uh, last night on the True Crime Talk Show. And I want to give credit where credit's due. The person that's been researching this, and I think that they're on to something. I truly, 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 truly do. But this experiment that everyone's talking about is not going to be the supporting evidence. We're going to have to find a different way because I think it is good evidence to create a... Uh, a hypothesis statement, like a hypothesis goal to dig in further. But this case, this science experiment doesn't have it. And I will walk everyone through it. So last night when we were talking about it, I shouted out Clo Penny and Clo Penny has been talking about this for a long time. They're actually the one who, uh, let told us about it like a long time ago. So, um, you know, I can only speak on my experience. And then last night when we were talking about get a clue, I know some people in our chat were like, Hey, you need a shout out, get a clue. And, uh, I want to clarify that too here that look, we love get a clue. I feel like we have mm -hmm. a great working relationship with get a clue where he feels comfortable watching our stuff and being like, Hey, you, I don't agree with you guys. You guys are wrong. Uh, and this is why, and we're comfortable watching his content being like, Hey, we don't agree with get a clue. This is why, you know what I mean? And it's done scientifically, it's done objectively and it's done respectfully. And I think that is the, uh, really important point here, right? So I have watched get a clues video now. I think it's really good. I think he takes us through all the important parts of it. Um, 
I don't know about get a clue's background. I have no idea. So obviously this experiment is not get a clues, right? So I, I don't feel like me attacking this experiment is attacking anything get a clue has to say. No, I think he will appreciate anything that's objective. Um, yeah. You know, that's what he cares about. Like, I know on the True Crime Talk Show when we brought this up, I started talking about the um, the button being painted. And I was concerned that could affect... Um, the ionization of the metal that causes the DNA to degrade um, rapidly. And I wondered if that could affect it. And I have been digging into that as hard as I can. There's very little information. So I've actually reached out to some people on it. Um, some people who are in forensics, hoping they will get back to me on that. But because um, I'm curious if there is any study out there that has anything to do with that, um, like literally brass being coated. Yeah, I, I've already reached out to the scientists. So there's three names on this science experiment. But you got to remember the science experiment is from 09. So a long time ago, 15 years ago. Oh, wow. Ago. I didn't realize that. <clears throat> yeah. Sci science usually doesn't get published for a long time after the experiments. But um and the general public knowing information is even further behind after that. You you're guys. right. You're Literally, right. Literally, it is. Uh, it, it's wild how far behind we are on things. Um, but it's true. So, um, okay. I want to dig into this. So shout out to Get a Clue for covering this topic. Uh, shout out to everyone else that had been covering this. Make a shout out to Clo Penny for uh digging into all of this and finding all this all right and i she, think she confirmed the k bar the button on the sheaths are made of brass yeah yeah absolutely which is so, a mixture of copper and zinc and copper is the worst for dna apparently yeah they actually test brass in here though yeah um, they do because brass is a different mixture so it's alkaloid base and like those things that have to do with the the degradation of a DNA sample uh, that comes into play with right. it. Um, so going into the actual experiment here, and I've already seen a whole bunch of people questioning the validity of this experiment through ways I don't agree with so far. Like one of them was talking about uh, how this uh, experiment said that there was identifiable DNA still at the end of all of these tests. And that is actually not true. It says very clear in here that the test time stopped as soon as there was not any essentially legible DNA. Once their testing instruments could no longer identify that it was DNA legibly, then uh, that test time stopped there. Okay. Mm, okay. Um, some of these went on for a very, very long time, but I haven't seen anyone talk about this yet and, and get a clue briefly went over it. There's a couple things I want to highlight here, right? Because the whole goal of everyone covering this is that try I want this to be true. Why I want this to be true is because I feel like there are big issues with the DNA sample. There's something to it with the way There's they include wrong. Othram, the fact that it is a leading ed edge technology science and we're being told there are no notes, there is no tracking, there is no data. Uh, that is uncommon. That is so institutionally uncommon are the institutions that focus on this well, use computer uh, as their work and data source. So that would be in the computers. So being told that there's no work product is a red flag to me. Can I mention something real quick? Also within the interim policy from the DOJ on FGG, which is forensic genetic genealogy. It literally says you don't destroy all of this information until like it's not needed anymore or until there's a conviction. They're not supposed to, they are supposed to destroy it, but there's certain criteria to destroying it. Like they destroyed it too quickly. If they destroyed all of it, mm -hmm. I'm questioning if it was destroyed because what did they Give over to Anne then. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah. I wonder if that was a lie <laughs> or like, you know, Bill Thompson didn't know. Yeah. He was told that, but it wasn't true yep. kind of thing. Look, I'm right there with you. And, and for, okay. So the rundown on the science experiment before I start pulling out my red flags here. Right. And I want, <clears throat> if anyone's an expert in this, I am not an expert in this topic. Okay. So call me out on it, please. You know, I, I'm not ever promising to be right. Uh, I'm promising to research science and science is ever evolving. So I'm going to be wrong more than I'm right here. Um, but what this experiment did is they took, uh, essentially, I'm going to keep it as vague as possible. They took trace DNA samples. They put those trace DNA samples onto metal to see how quickly uh, or how how prolonged uh, the metal surface would degrade the DNA sample. Yeah, many different types of metal, right? Many different types of metal. We can get into the details of it, but we're highlighting one specific type of metal, right? Because uh, we've been told through the investigation in the Idaho 4 that there was a knife sheath left on the scene of the crime. And that knife sheath was a K-bar knife sheath. The K-bar knife sheath has a brass button. That brass button had uh, DNA in or around it of Brian Koberger's, right? Well, uh, Clo Penny had has been talking about this for a very, 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 very long time saying, hey, something's not right here. Look into this, you guys. And, and she contacted and K-Bar and confirmed that all yep. their knife sheets are made with brass buttons. Yep. Contacted K-Bar and, and got all that done and everything. Um, yeah. And then found this science experiment, which um, I think... Clo Penny had been frustrated that no one picked up the story, but uh, science goes a long way to back a statement, right? And and I'm guilty of that too, where I was just talking about this a minute ago, that the way that I look at things is I take everything that's said from people as false until proven true, right? Um, so the study is what the study makes is what, you interested. Exactly. And you know, what's really strange is I, st is when she posted it, I started looking into it, but like literally at the same time that all the drama started happening. Cause I didn't even see any content. I was just like, Oh, this is amazing. I totally remember hearing about this. I know. Cause you, you know? brought it up before that video was ever made. And yep. it was, you said on Reddit. Yep. And I was like, and then I saw that video the next day and I was like, Oh, Yep. So this is a big conversation going around. It is. It is. It is. All right. So um, they tested all of these DNAs um, in the uh, in different settings. They did it in a dark setting. They did it in a light setting and they put uh, DNA on these metal surfaces to check how long they last. And now brass came up with a very very interesting outcome. Uh, it, it lasted no longer than a 24 hour period. Um, I thought it was 12 hours. No, when you, when you look at it, we can pull it up real quick here. Um, so experimental time points. And then what does that mean? Uh, minimum was 14.85, maximum was 20.82. Uh, now, when you go down to brass, uh, it is 4, 12, 2, 12. Uh, that is the cellular mixture. Uh, table 5 is time after which DNA became undetectable. And what's interesting when you go down here, hang on. The persistence data for brass is presented in figure 10 from time 0 to 24 hours on a linear scale. The DNA did not persist in any form for longer than 24 hours on this metal. Okay, but is... In any form for longer than 24 hours on this metal. As you can see here, uh, it says uh, when a solution containing only CF DNA, which for those of you, CF DNA is cell free DNA uh, and it's found in like biofluid or it's free of biofluids and its cellular origins. Um, 
So when, when a solution containing only CFDNA was deposited on brass after one hour, samples stored in a dart produced a DNA recovery of 84%. In contrast, when CFDNA sample, samples were stored under normal or humid, humid conditions, the ability of the DNA to persist after one hour was reduced and recovery fell below 16%. The ability to recover DNA deposit deposited alone decreased rapidly and after four hours became completely undetectable when stored in any environmental condition. Unsurprisingly, samples stored in the dark and normal environments persisted longer at higher amounts than those stored in humid conditions. So why I'm not digging into like the nitty gritty here, I understand people have focused on that four hour mark, but I'm going back to what I was saying. This whole test is flawed. Everything about it is flawed. Now I'll, I'll get to that point. But so we're we're on a consensus here, right? That none of the tests la lasted longer than a 24 hour period, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. So going back to what I was originally saying, the uh, the sample DNA. This is really important. Really, really important. I think a lot of people miss this. Okay. So. The cell-free component used cell-free component used for this study came from rainbow trout, which were donated by a local fisherman. The trout's livers were removed and the DNA was extracted, and then using a standard phenyl uh, chloroform protocol uh, and a machine. I forget what that machine's called. I think it's electrophoresis. Uh, the extracted DNA was stored and frozen until required. They stored it in a liquid uh, and, and extracted the DNA, sonicated for 30 minutes in order to reduce the molecular weight, making it more representative of CFDNA. Okay, so we got that coming from trout DNA. They are manipulating that the DNA that they're using to make it more like CFDNA coming from a, a bio liver from the trout. Got it? Okay. Okay. Um, so then we're going to look at the mouse embryonic fibroblasts were donated to this project uh, by the School of Life Sciences at the University of Dundee. Calls Cells were removed from the tissue culture flask by uh, trypsin and it trypsin is sation uh and wash three times with phosphate buffered saline um cell concentrated was determined by staining with four six dia diamedino uh i'm not even gonna try uh i'm in, i'm just gonna hack that all up cells were then resuspended at a concentration of uh one by ten six uh 20 percent glycerol phosphate buffered saline okay so everyone got that, right? I guess. Okay. So y you got it enough to understand that they had to make adjustments to the DNA at a cellular level in order to make it more representative of the testing samples that they wanted to conduct, right? Okay. So next they used synthetic fingerprint solution, synthetic fingerprint solution, okay? Uh, and remember, I want this test to be valid and be able to be argued in court, you guys. The synthetic fingerprint solution was created following a procedure described by Cisco et al. with some alterations as highlighted, with some alterations as highlighted. A synthetic, uh, ecrine, whatever, solution and a synthetic sebum solution were made sebum, separately. Sebum, that's your skin oil. Yeah. Uh, solution were made separately and mixed to create a synthetic emulsion, which was subsequently diluted to create a synthetic fingerprint solution. Then it goes in here to break down exactly what that fingerprint solution was. It gives you the five inorganic salts, amino acids, other uh, components, and then it tells you what they did by running it through a filter vacuum filtration unit to reduce the serum, change the composition, and uh, be able to make it be able to make it bind with the fatty acids needed. Okay, so everyone understands here that this test 
is being used as a representation to uh, say that human trace DNA is not usable and can't hold up in a court of law because this testing says so. Hmm? That that's the argument, right? That the DNA cannot hold well, up in a court of law, specifically in this case, because of the metal. Because therefore, it can't withhold within you know four hour to twenty four hour period. However, every single sample they're using in this testing is not human or fake. It's man made. So when you're looking at it from the point of view of a court system. A court will not accept this. There is no uh, evidence that can be gained from this testing that will relate to a human trace DNA. Now, get a clue went over this and he went over the, the salmon portion or whatever and was like, that's not a big deal. DNA is DNA. It's not, unfortunately. So. In here, it talks about the pH balance of the solution and the DNA that they're running, okay? So, they're running it at a standard 5.5 pH balance. Do you know what a human is? What? A, a human is 7.5, or depending on uh, the upper body versus the lower body, it could be as high as 8, which totally changes the the, the composition and it, uh acidic nature of what you're using as a test sample. The pH balance is going to react differently on each of these metals dealing with an alkaloid. So I go back to trying to understand how this is evidence that this can't be true. I think this is an awesome starting point, like great starting point. This will never, ever, ever get brought up in court. Never, never. There is no scientist that would be able to come into court and say, for sure, court, I can tell you without a doubt that the trace DNA that was left on that brass button that was human DNA, that was Brian Koberger's DNA, couldn't have lasted long, longer than four hours on that brass button because let me show you how relatable it is to uh, trout DNA with fake solution using and recreating recreating a fingerprint uh, solution that is inorganic, completely man-made. It's just not going to happen. It is not going to happen, right? And And one of the things... I was worried about bringing this up, right? Because, uh, again, like I said, so many people talked about this. And I think this is a great starting point. But we're not being true to ourselves at Thought Riot Podcast if we're not scrutinizing everything. Scrutinizing everything, okay? We are completely unbiased. Would I love this to be the, the reason why the DNA is so shoddy in this case? Would I love... To be able to prove that without a doubt, there was no human DNA left on there. I would love it because I think something's wrong here. But this does not tell us that. So so what this, I think, this study tells us is that there absolutely is an issue with brass and DNA. So if it's as they said, and it was found on this button, there are major questions there, but we need... We need a study using human DNA. We need a study using human DNA. To see what the actual Correct. viability times are. Like at what point. Not just that, but also because court has a very high relatability factor, okay? And a lot of people that, a lot of experts lose that in court where your argument you can have an argument that's less true than another expert. And if you're relatable in that argument, then your argument is going to have a bigger impact on that case. Unfortunately, I think if you put this in front of any skilled attorney, they're going to rip it apart. They're going to make it sound like, so how can you tell me, Mr. Expert, with confidence that uh, you can take trout DNA and, and, and 
it's going to do the same exact thing as uh, human DNA, fingerprint DNA, with all the oils, with all the other things that are involved uh, on a fingerprint, right? Um, and not only that, but it, include it into your man-made solution that is supposed to replicate finger oils uh, to be thrown on this test and then effectively prove that uh, that the human sample would degrade. I it's not going to happen. It is not going to happen. And and let me let me talk on this part too because this is really important. So as you guys, so I don't. Most of you probably know by now that I have a bachelor of science. So not science like this. I was never in a lab doing like testing on biology or chemistry or anything like that. But, uh, uh, science, science, uh, discussions, materials, hypotheses, uh, tests, and the conclusion of those all write up the same. They all write up exactly the same, all right? And at the end of any test, there's always a either general considerations in this situation or like honor, honorable mentions, honorary mentions for the test itself. So these are variables that should be taken into account. And, and the reader needs to understand that these variables could have, you know... Uh, it could have a variation on the outcome of the testing here, okay? So 4.2, in this work, we have attempted to evaluate the effect of metal surfaces on the persistence of cellular and DNA exposed to three different environmental conditions. However, it is important that to highlight that the altering that altering the variables used within the experiment could influence the observed results. For example, changing the DNA collection method in this work, we used a single cotton swab moistened with EB buffer to collect all DNA samples. In practice, there are many swab types available in conjunction with different swabbing techniques, uh, any combination of which may influence recovery efficiency. Additionally, alternative to swabbing, tape lifting is also commonly used for DNA collection and can be assumed to influence recovery efficiency in a different way had it been employed in this study. Another variable that would likely influence the observed results is, is if changed would be altering the method of DNA uh, deposition. It can be assumed that changing the mode of the DNA uh, deposition from gentle pipetting to smearing, spraying, or dropping from a varied height in conjunction with the varying the volume or total DNA of deposits would also have an effect on the results and would be worthwhile area to investigate. In a recent paper by Hughes, uh, attention was drawn to the effect texture of a non-porous surface could have on the recovery of biological samples in addition to the adherence of such samples on a surface. They highlight that surface tension and hydrophobicity of a deposit can drive the adhesion of deposits to a surface along with the surface roughness, thus indicating that changing the deposit volume or sample makeup could influence the sample's interaction with the metal surface and influence persistence. Additionally, this probably has some relevance where the deposited material has a corrosive effect. Remember that pH, you guys. The, the pH balance used here was manipulated to a 5.5, whereas a human's is 7.5 and could be as high as 8, okay? However, given the size of the current persistence project and the number of samples involved in this study using the defined experimental procedure, it was impractical to test or monitor changing the variables. And it even goes so far in here to, uh, to say that the reason why we did the DNA in this way, because in order for us to use human DNA, we would have had to get swab kits. Those swab kits would have been wildly ineffective in price, and we wouldn't have been able to run this test using those. 
Yeah. So we need to start a GoFundMe to have our own study done. Yeah. So womp, womp, <laughs> womp on this test, at least. There yeah. is nothing here. And I wish there I, was. I don't agree that there's nothing here. I think it it proves that this deserves a further look into seeing uh, how long a human's DNA could survive in that environment. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. I just mean that the, this made no progress in the starting point from a uh, criminal investigative uh, point of view, from a criminal uh, from a criminal investigative angle. This doesn't add value to anything that you would find in a crime scene. I reached out to the scientists involved, and like I said, this test was 15 years ago. Um, and I put a whole bunch of questions together <clears throat> asking them, what, what was the monetary difference in using the human testing versus this testing here? Because in my opinion, uh, I would think that creating uh, a man-made solution it renders your argument like ineligible in this case because they're talking specifically about trace DNA. And one of the people involved here is actually part of a police force um, in a different area in the world. Uh, but this, this test can't be used. Like it cannot effectively be used because the amount of changing variables in this test it put adds too much separation from human DNA, whether you're talking about the pH, which is a massive deal. I don't know why they used 5.5. The only reason that I could think is because a pH of 5.5 is known for being the most, the most reliable and easy to handle. It, yeah. It's, it's like the base level, right? In the middle. It, yeah. It's, Absolutely right in the middle. Correct. So, so it's not too alkaloid or too acidic, but if that's, but that changes everything. It, in yeah. The test. If you're looking at human DNA, like clear, correct. that is acidic. It, that clearly matters. Using human DNA. I just want to be clear here. Using t human DNA in a test like this, like in the increased pH, it could cause quicker deterioration. The correct pH. Yeah, oh. it could. I mean, theoretically, right? And where we need to look at this from is this is all theoretical. This is all theoretical. Okay. The whole thing is theoretical in uh, when you're looking at it from a human DNA point of view. So, yeah, I would love a scientist to... Uh, to use human examples, you know, we, we saw trace DNA science tests that were done and maybe the 15 years has made it cheaper, but they did the test on the transfer of trace DNA on, um, a knife handle. You know what I mean? Hmm. So yeah, the, yeah, the, yeah, we saw that one. We talked yep, about it, right? This one did. we did talk about with transferring and like how some people had like more of the other person's DNA than their own. Yep. Like when they touched it. Yep. Yeah. All that stuff. That was a really interesting study. Super it, interesting. It was. And it makes you seriously question the validity of touch DNA. It, it, it just has to remain circumstantial evidence. Like while it's a big deal to find touch DNA at a crime scene and it can be a huge lead for investigators, you just don't know how it got there. I and that totally matters. Agree. That matters. Yep. Totally. But I'm agree questioning with you. I'm in the Koberger case, Idaho 4 case, I'm questioning the validity of that knife sheath and what they collected from it. Um, and I think a lot of people are because it seems so strange. Yeah. Yeah. I, I personally think, look, if you're going to do a test like this and, and you're going to connect it, uh, with criminal investigations in some way, um, why wouldn't you use live human samples? Yeah. I just don't get it. Ask a human being to touch that metal surface and then. Uh, now that we have the, the testing that we have at, at, at such a, uh, 
microscopic level, you know, like literally where we're pulling DNA out of the air now. Um, I would think that this test is outdated and old, and we should be able to increase the effectiveness of these tests now, and it should be even cheaper. Yeah, I agree. I think there's ways to make, do this and it'd be cheaper. Yep. But let me know what you guys think. I think I probably went uh, a little bit longer there than I planned, but it's interesting. And I think these topics are really important. And uh, I just want to give another shout out to Clopenny. This is an awesome, awesome, awesome find. And I hope that, you know, me just being critical, right. And, and scrutinizing every single thing that we touch, uh, is, uh, you know, not looked at as a negative thing because science, we just need to go find a better study. Yeah. The best scientists are the ones that scrutinize everything, right? Don't accept nothing. Be a, uh, contrarian to, you know, as deeply as you can be in any topic that you can be big, all the questions of why, how, who, you know? Yeah. So. But anyways, interesting for sure. Let us know. Let us know what? What you think. Okay. We are going to get into some more Delphi, the shenanigans in Delphi. Mm. Um, you know, just take a minute to remember justice for the victims and their families, Abby and Libby, as all of this ridiculousness is going on. And apparently the destruction of evidence is what is alleged in a new motion filed by the defense. It's very interesting. We're going to get into that in a minute. But first, I wanted to say that, of course, Judge Goal made a judgment on the motion to disqualify and her judgment was, I'm not disqualifying myself and I'm not giving you an explanation other than the Indiana Supreme Court unanimously denied the defendant's previous request on January 18th, which is interesting because she filed this before the Supreme Court's written ruling ever came out. And she cites the Supreme Court's decision on it like she knew something. So I have an article here by Fox 59, and it's literally entitled Delphi Murderers Judge Denies Motion to Disqualify, citing Indiana Supreme Court's prior ruling. And that whole ruling hadn't even come out yet. They hadn't even described why they didn't give him relief on disqualifying the judge, uh, which that ruling has since came out. Um, and it sounds like essentially like the basic rundown is that judge goal messed up. She shouldn't have gotten rid of the lawyers, um, that, that, that was not okay. And it did, they did feel like procedurally that the writ of mandamus was justified in the situation and that, you know, they granted relief. We all saw it, but as far as the judge they did understand the judge's concerns with the leaked evidence um, and the issues she had with the defense attorneys. They, they said that they believed that she was right to be concerned about those things, but the issue is how she, what she did about it. She could have done, you know, Hennessy, the guy, the lawyer that represented um, Baldwin, and Rosie, and actually is going to be representing them in the hearing that's upcoming about um, the contempt of court stuff the state has alleged against the defense attorneys. He's uh, filed his representation for them. Um, he even said, you know, you could dock their pay. You could do anything. You could do anything to, you know, reprimand, hold them accountable for that situation. It was just such an extreme measure to do what she did. Too extreme. Yeah. So their justification essentially was nothing proved she was biased and that she was right to be concerned. It was just the action she took wasn't justified. But So they didn't see it as enough to disqualify her. Yeah, I, I just don't agree. 
I don't agree. Well, you and know, maybe they didn't present the same arguments. I, I'm, I, I watched that hearing, uh, and I don't remember if I'm pretty sure the newest document that we went over last week had more, uh, details in it around her bias it than they presented. I think it did too. And I wondered why, because I, they, well, because more has, hap more has happened. You know, like that has all concluded. So they have more, like she right after that, when they got reinstated, she just denied all of their motions off the bat, which is insane. And with no hearings on any of it, I think the fact that she's including the prosecution should that alone by itself should be enough to remove her. And that's she, not OK. Yeah. So she hasn't ruled or um, done anything about the. Um, the allegations the defense has made against the prosecutor so far, um, which is interesting. But anyway, let's, let's get to the new stuff that has come out. I swear there's new stuff constantly. Like I can't even keep up with it at this point anymore. Um, it's just, it's too much, but, uh, there's a new motion and have it right here. It is motion to dismiss for destroying exculpatory evidence. And essentially what they are going over is that there were interviews with Brad Holder and Patrick Westfall um, within like the first week of the murders. They were on to Brad Holder and Patrick Westfall like a week into the murders. Which is insane. So it's interesting. And I, I'm so curious how they connected those dots, but think that there's not any continued worth in looking. Yeah. So so let's let's get into it. Um so they're they're incorporating some of what they put in the Franks memorandum into this. So in discovery, the defense found a document dated February 17th, 2017, that appears to be an FBI report memorializing an interview of Brad Holder. Contained within the document are these words. The below is an interview summary. It is not intended to be a verbatim account and does not memorialize all statements made during the interview. Communications by the parties in the interview room were electronically recorded. The recording captures the actual words spoken, uh, which is, is really okay. Okay. Not mm -hmm. so the summary doesn't include all words. Right. So what do you think happens next? Obviously they're going to request the actual recording because it says it was recorded, right? Right. So also in the discovery, the defense found a document dated February 19th, 2017, that memorializes an interview with Patrick Westfall, too. The report itself does not indicate whether the interview was recorded, although the defense would expect, because it's standard procedure, that it would have been. So after they got the document, they saw a copy of the recording, of course, because they want to see what was said. And in the Franks memo, we know that they there was many allegations against these men, several men, but they were two of the most important because there's even statements by Brad Holder's ex that Patrick Westfall was that Brad told her, Holder told her that he absolutely did have something to do with the Delphi murders and the Flora murders, and that if she didn't stop asking questions, she was going to get killed. Oh, yeah. So, I mean, clearly this is of utmost importance to these defense attorneys considered this is the direction they're going. They truly believe that people who had onus beliefs had something to do with this. Um, so they sought the recording and they wanted to see exactly what Brad Holder said, because it's clearly vital to the case. They need to see if there's any statements that where he's lying. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. I get it. They need to vet everything. Like, I, I feel like that's pretty obvious. Um, so they requested it on September 8th, 2023. The prosecutor communicated in a letter. There were no audio, 
or video interviews of Brad Holder or Patrick Westfall available. McClelland offered no explanation as to why they didn't exist. Before the defense had an opportunity to do anything about it, because clearly they were uh, kicked off the case, and McClelland asked for the disqualification of them, and then Judge Gohl was like, yeah, I, I want to do that. I do want to kick them off the case. And then she did do it. Um, they couldn't look into it. Mm. So then January 31st, this year, 2024, they were reinstated and the prosecution handed over discovery to the defense, including, which I saw some people asking, wait, how did they not see this in the discovery before? Well, because they were reinstated and they were handed up over some new stuff. I feel like that's obvious. Yeah. Including a letter, cattle, and even if they hadn't gone through every bit of discovery before this, so? Yeah. Like, it takes a long time. I don't think it matters, yeah. Including a letter cataloging the evidence that the prosecutor was turning over to the defense, contained on, contained on page five, paragraph five, of the itemi itemization of the discovery are words that explain Brad Holder's missing videotaped interview. And Patrick Westfalls. And I, I quote, due to a DVR program error discovered on 9 20, 2017. So that's months later after the murders, a few months. Mm -hmm. All recordings up to February 20th, 2017 were recorded over. There is no detectable audio found on this drive. No. Remember, Brad Holder and Patrick Westfall were interviewed during this very short window from February 14th to February 20th within days of the murders. The videotaped interviews were deleted by the police. They, they stated that very blatantly, you guys. It is unknown that what other interviews were deleted during the relevant time frames. The destruction Whoa. of this material... Uh, interviews of key suspects early in the investigation demonstrates negligence, if not intentional mis intentional conduct, misconduct, I assume, yeah. on, this, on the part of the state. How could law enforcement, while investigating the most serious of crimes, record <clears throat> over interviews of material suspects with recklessness or intentionality with a question mark? That's interesting. So they're leaving it like it's either complete recklessness and negligence and incompetence or they did it on purpose. Yeah. I th look who what's weird to me is that the FBI was involved in this and the FBI is the one who wrote the Odinus report. So did somebody from the local department mess with the FBI's files? I don't see the FBI deleting interviews like that. Yeah, but I would I gotta and think about this for a in second. In 2017 because, with a DVR, like DVR, what does that mean? It it means it's internal uh storage. Okay. Digital video video recording program. Digital video recording program. Okay. Uh, so I'm assuming it's hooked up to a computer that it's not like, oh, uh, turn on the CD burner and let's get that camera going. It's it's the in, the output is going directly to a computer where they can store that. So how how it like records over? I, I I have no idea. It doesn't Computers make, don't work like that. No, it doesn't make sense. They create sense. a new file. Exactly. It doesn't make sense. And it's funny that everything up till February 20th is gone. And they didn't discover it until what the... So that's September, right? Yes. Nine, nine something. That's the month of September. So what, they didn't go looking for the video recordings of these interviews until September? Why? 
why did they not notice it right away? And why did they not try to remedy it by bringing them back in to talk to him again? It's really weird. Um, also, how did they write a summary without the vi video or audio? Because if oh, I that's a really good point. Yeah. I'm curious when that summary was written, then that would be my next question. Yeah. How was that summary written? What date was that written? Like, that matters. Or did they literally write it throughout the time they were talking to them? But you wouldn't normally do that because it's an audio. No, like, you know, it's, it's being, being recorded. recorded. Yeah. They're not going to be writing. That's a not summary happen. is normally based off the audio. Like, you're not, there's no way a police officer is doing that completely off of memory. Especially not if you talk to them for a few hours. Like, you are not doing that off memory. So yeah. I feel like it had to be, they had to do it based off of the audio. I don't, that's just really strange to me. Um, it is strange. I don't I understand it. Really it. strange, too. I, I mean, I, I think they're right to question the intentions or um, what was behind this. So... As a material part of the defense, Richard Allen is expected to direct attention towards Brad Holder and Patrick Westfall as being involved in the murders of these two young victims. So that's interesting that they literally give us a clue like this is where we're going with this. We believe these men had something to do with it. Like that's very clearly stated here, which is kind of wild to me. Like they're all throwing it out on the table, which I feel like is not typical uh, for defense attorneys. Um. And that Richard Allen didn't know them, so he had nothing to do with it. Uh, this destroyed videotaped interview of these two men, if it ever existed, was expected to contain evidence that could provide exculpatory um, and material evidence in support of the defense. If a recording of Westfall was ever secured, that too is a purposeful or ne negligent failure to preserve material and exculpatory evidence. So basically, if they didn't record Westfall's interview, that's also a problem, which I agree. Um, they basically just say, like, recording an interview is significant. Like, it's really important, which I agree, which is why in the Idaho 4 case, we question why there's only the FBI's recording and none other that we know about. Like, it's really strange, too. Um, but uh, I want to get to the warrants. Because they also, well, wait, we have to talk about what Brad Holder said. So the state actions have deprived the defense from the ability to compare Brad Holder's words from only three days after the crime to evidence that was unearthed over the next years, you know. Um, and they do say here that they did find an inconsistency in Brad Holder's statements because they did pull Brad Holder in in 2023 to re-interview him, which is interesting. Yeah. So, um, on August 30th, 2023, following depositions in which the state of Indiana and law enforcement learned the defense believed Brad Holder to be an actor in the murders, law enforcement finally re-interviewed Holder. Since 2017, they never pulled him back in until 2023 when the defense put out that memorandum is when the law enforcement finally pulled them back in. I mean, it, it, it feels like negligence. Yeah. So in the memorialized report in 2017, uh, Brad Holder said he never met Abigail w Williams, Abby Williams, who supposedly dated his son, right? He claimed he never met her. Well, on 20, in 2023, his story changed um, when he talked to law enforcement. He said, and it says, at the 39, oh, 39 minutes and 9 seconds mark, I barely even knew that girl. I met her once. When he claimed back then, right after the murders, three days after the murders, that he had never met her. Shady. Really shady. Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, yeah, that's a huge contradiction. Why would you deny meeting her if she was dating your son and you weren't involved? Why wouldn't you say that? Why? Well, I, I didn't really know her. You know, my son was dating her, but I only met her one time. Like that's, 
saying I never met her once is highly suspicious to me. That, that guy is just suspicious. He is incredibly suspicious. This is a guy who had pictures on his Facebook, literally like pictures that look so much like the crime scene that it's disturbing and shocking before that information ever came out to the public. Like early on, within the same year that it happened, like within months, I'm pretty sure. Um, so it also discovered from former Rushville police officer Todd Click, uh, reached out to Prosecutor McClelland in an attempt to bring to his attention the existence of an 85 page report summarizing the investigation that revolved around Brad Holder, Westfall, and others' affiliates. Um, the letter landed on McLeland's desk May 1st, 2023, and was not discovered to the defense for more than four months later, September 8th, 2023. And only after the defense disclosed uh -huh. its depositions and that they were aware of Odinist ties to the crime scene investigation. So once they started deposing people, then McLean was like, okay, here, here's the Odin report. <laughs> the failure That's to disclose that is ridiculous. It absolutely is. Um, so clearly that's a problem. Um, so there's also about the professor's statements. We already know about the Purdue professor and how they, it, it, it's apparent it was a lie, you know, them saying they couldn't find him and that he said there was no evidence of like Odinous, anything Odinous there, uh, at the crime scene, but clearly he did not say that. He yeah. did agree that there was signs of like some kind of Odinous nature to the crime. There is, but it's interesting to highlight that there's still to this day uh, people that are looking at this case and they're like, you guys are crazy. There's no way that racist Odinists that believe in the the... I almost did something to make fun of them, but if it was snipped, it would have looked really bad. But uh, there's no way that racist Odinists that are all white power um, would end two white girls. Oh, not true. That That is not true. And we gave a ton of evidence covering this topic from a bunch of different cases where they've ended white people. Yeah, it's, the gang that is involved yeah. with the Odinistic beliefs, yeah. and yes, if they were involved with somebody that was of color, they or doing something they didn't like. Yep, yep. Murderous individuals are going to murder. Okay, yes. It, it they may have like separate reasons for murdering separate different kinds of people, but I mean, come on. It if they can so murder anybody, they anybody they can murder anybody it just you know so I mean? happens that they have a flag they can fly their horrible actions under and and try to justify them correct yeah yep. so listen to this cell phone guy hmm. in more recent discovery defense also located a prepared search warrant application to at&t for data contained on brad holders and Patrick Westfall's mobile devices. Each application states that Holder Westfall is a known member of a religious sect and elements of the murders have potential religious significance. Okay, this was drafted back then in 2017. These search warrants were drafted and said this. Um, the information being requested is relevant to an ongoing criminal investigation. There's no evidence the that the warrant was ever served. Also, the it's defense has not located any sect. Like it's very obvious connections with a gang. Yeah, I know. Uh, there is no evidence that the warrant was ever served. Also, the defense has not located any discovery regarding any data contained on holders or Westfall's 2017 phones or any other electronic devices. It defies logic that law enforcement would conduct forensic examinations of so many other phones in this investigation, yet ignore the phones of Holder and Westfall, who were viewed as suspects within three days of the murders and interviewed by law enforcement. And then they prepared search warrants for the phones and never served them. Is that not bewildering? Yes. So then they asked for a hearing. 
uh, because they want to present this evidence and talk about it in court. Um, I don't believe there's been a response to that yet. Um, I know there's the upcoming hearing about their own contempt of court. Um, so I'm sure Judge Gold wants to try to, you know, kick him off the case again, if she can, before anybody has to answer any of these questions. <laughs> yeah. But clearly, she got two new defense attorneys, and they saw the same problems. So kicking, what does kicking them off the case do? I mean, I'm not confident in them. In who? The two new defense attorneys. I'm talking about Rosie and Bald Rosie and Baldwin. Oh, what does oh, kicking oh, them yeah. off have anything to do with anything? How is that going to help? Because the new attorneys that are now the not uh, their you know the defense team anymore, they stepped down after ba Baldwin and Rosie were reinstated. Um, they saw the same problem. That's my point. Is I don't know if I trust those two. Oh, okay. That they so, were going along with it I think for that, some other motives? Yes, and I think that uh, it could be with the intent of trying to get them kicked off again and them being willing to pass the torch. Like, oh, these guys back what we're saying, then it's done, right? I see what you're saying. I mean, I... Uh, That's some tin hat stuff, but I think it's very possible because I... Look, you have uh, Coffin Daffer doubting goal. Yep. Do you understand that? That's Do you a big deal. What I just said. Coffin Daffer. Yeah. Saying goal doesn't feel like she's trustworthy. No. I I feel like at this point it's pretty obvious that um there's something corrupt here. It's pretty apparent. Something is corrupt here. I I I would literally bet money on it that there's something corrupt going on in this, uh, county and city. Um, there's an issue. I, I don't know who started it. It could have been anybody in the police force or law enforcement that started it. And it feels like a cover up thereafter. So yep. one thing that I wanted to mention real quick is what I, I, I wonder if we should, um, watch it cause I'm curious your take on it, but, McClelland was not the prosecutor on this case when it first happened. It was another guy. And I saw uh, Jules of All Trades, shout out to her, play that interview and talk about it. And I found that very intriguing um, because he acts like they had so much evidence. So much evidence. He's like, we thought this was a piece of cake. We were going to have it solved in a week. And I was like, what? How could you walk up to that where a girl's body is drained of blood and there's like symbols and think we got this in a week? That would scream like, oh my gosh, this is like Zodiac killer, <laughs> you know, like yeah. this is scary. This is scary. He said he they weren't even that concerned about the disappearance of Abby and Libby at first. Like, oh, two kids went missing. Oh, they're probably all right. They're just lost in the woods. I mean, that shows their uh, lack of experience. Well, that's their what he said. to He's... effectively manage, you know, as a police force. Yeah, well, I agree. It His interview was extremely concerning for me. And I don't know. I just, I feel like there's a major issue here. I feel like there's some kind of tight knit interconnectedness among officials in this area that is problematic. And I want to know where Odinism, Patrick Westfall and Brad Holder fit into that equation, because there has to be a connection of why they protected these men, because that's what I see not serving search warrants when you did tons of other people. Tons of other people got search warrants on their phones and their like property and all kinds of things. And they were suspects three days in. How did they get on their radar three days in? I... And the interviews are gone. No search warrants were served. What? I don't understand. I don't get it. I really don't. I have no clue. Something's up. Something's up. Somebody Something's is related up. to somebody. Somebody owes somebody a favor. Somebody's got blackmail. Something is up. Yep. 
why did the first judge judge step off the case? Was it blackmail to get a, a special judge on the case? All right. I I'm just, just saying. Know. I'm just saying. And we know that Odinism is not just located in Delphi. It is an Indiana thing. Like most of these guys lived in Rushville. Yes. Or yeah. went to Rushville to hang out and do things. Like Absolutely. It is a statewide thing, especially looking into the Vinlanders and and you know, skinhead gangs and stuff. There's it's not just this area, it is Indiana. Yeah. There is a particular problem in Indiana with this kind of thinking. So I'm curious what you guys think about this. Um, you know, one interesting thing also that I want to mention real quick is that I have heard over and over there was DNA found at the scene, but it is nowhere. I found a blog a long time ago where supposedly there was some kind of interview where DNA was mentioned early on in the case. And, the, and then they were asking the question, like, what happened to the DNA evidence? Why is that not being talked about in Richard Allen's case? Like, and then I heard somebody say, well, they said it was um, not testable. Like it was too degraded or something like that. The girl's bodies were found pretty quickly. Yeah. So I don't know. I don't know. I Was that destroyed too? Um, I don't know. It's an interesting question, but I, I really hope they take this up the chain again. Um, I know Allison Mata from Defense Diaries said that they'd have to do an appeal. Not they couldn't probably take this to the Supreme Court again to get Judge Gull off the case. Yeah, they got to ask you. You have to give a judge uh, on most in most situations and most requests uh, and 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 everything. You have to always ask twice. I don't know why that is, but like with everything. You got to give a. You got to appeal it and give the judge a chance to change their opinion before you go above their head. Right, but the Supreme Court, like, for, I don't know. I don't remember her explanation. I'm not a lawyer, but apparently, doing an interlocutory appeal or whatever it, is the next step. Hmm. So I, I wonder if they can just get it changed to a totally different county. Like somewhere else, different judge, different everything. Special prosecutor, get rid of the prosecutor, get rid I of just, anybody connected to Delphi. I just don't understand how it's okay to have him in prison. No, I don't. And I feel like I don't understand that either. I feel like that should give the in for the DOJ to enter this scene. Like, well, yesterday. I don't under understand how the Supreme Court didn't grant him relief in that and put him in a county jail. Anyway, this it's so frustrating for me. Like it's such a big problem. Um and it is frustrating because the victims, like it, it yeah. is such a circus and it is such a lack of accountability. And this is literally the our great work around the war on drugs. This is this is the outcome of it. We have a justice system that's been militarized in a way where they're not used to being questioned. Well, and the good old boys club, as I think what's going on here, too. It is totally a good old boys club, in my opinion. I think yeah. that's part of the problem here. I, is and it's I the think problem. It's a good old boys club. I think these are just gang members. It's a small town, though. And I think there may be that added element, but I don't. I don't know, man. It's just scary. It's really scary. Like, super scary. It's actually kind of terrifying. And this was one of the most horrendous murders, I think, of, like, our generation. One of the worst. Period. What happened to these little girls. And whoever did it needs to be held accountable. Whether that's Richard Allen or that's the other alleged people. But yep. I want to know what you think. So definitely leave it in the comments. If you have any suggestions, theories, ideas, I want to hear them. Um, yeah, because that's what Thought Right Podcast is all about. All right, you guys. We are digging into a viewer-requested topic, and it is around cell phones. So, I'm very excited. <laughs> yeah, I'm I'm not digging like into my normal 
cell phone technology data, but we had quite a few people ask, okay? Okay. What is a cell dump? What is a cell phone tower dump? And what we're talking about specifically here is in relation to the uh, Brett Payne's Exhibit A, PCA. On page 11, it starts saying, as part of this investigation, law enforcement obtained search warrants to determine cellular devices that utilize cellular towers in close proximity to the King Road residence on November 3rd, 2022, between 3 a.m. and 5 a.m. So we'll start there. All right. Got it. What they're talking about is what is called a cell tower data dump. Now, this should not be confused with a cell phone data dump. Okay. I think a lot of people out there, uh, and I've talked about this quite a few times before that, um, for whatever reason, okay, I think it's because we're all moving into a, a a more progressive technological era. And I think people, a lot of people out there in the world feel like they should know more about technology than they know, right? So a lot of times you, I, I've encountered in my experience in network technology where you have these people that are afraid to admit that they don't know exactly what these things mean, right? Mm -hmm. Where they will just read something like Brett Payne's Exhibit A and 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 try to piece it together like the human mind does. You know, when there's something we don't completely understand, we guesstimate, right? Uh, but when we're talking about like forensic science, digital evidence, and data. Uh, it's not a great thing to guesstimate. You know, mm, I do no. it myself. I'm not calling anyone out here. If anything, I'm talking about myself when I'm reading things. You know, I think the story I just did, uh, there was a lot of guesstimation work in there that I then had to go and figure out and confirm because, look, I'm not a DNA expert. I got to figure this stuff out as I go. You know what I mean? Even though we have learned a lot on it. But with technology, with networks, uh, with network solutions, uh, cellular networks specifically, towers, things of that nature. Um, I got that stuff down. Um, now, what is uh, a cell phone data dump, right? Because a cell dump is a, a super generic term. And one word changes everything, okay? So we'll start with... What is a cell phone data dump? Now, when a police officer or in an investigation, you read something that says a cell phone data dump, okay? That means that they have these, these little hardware boxes, okay? Let's, my ADD toy here, okay? My ADD toy here. So they have these little boxes and they could literally be this big, you guys. All right. And uh, they are, uh, there's a whole bunch of different brands, but one commonly known brand is, is called uh, Celebrite, Celebrite Solutions. And what it does is you take this little box and you plug one end into the uh, computer, you plug another end into a phone and it forcibly transfers all the data out of the phone by data. I mean, pictures, uh, phone calls, uh, emails, uh, everything. It doesn't matter what it is. Essentially it has the power to mirror that phone. That's something that we've talked about quite a few times when we're talking in relation to the victim's phones and why they haven't given that information back to the families. Either a, there's some evidentiary findings in there or B, it's planning on being used uh, in the case as, uh, you know, some some kind of imagery tactic to use in front of the jury. I don't know. Uh, but they haven't given it back to them. I don't know why. But that is a cell phone data dump. Good? Mm -hmm. Okay, now we add one word. What is a cell phone tower data dump? One word uh, changes everything. All right? What a cell phone tower data dump is, which isn't allowed in all states, 
or has very specific specifications around it is law enforcement going to a cell tower owner or plural if there's multiple uh, cell phone companies on there, which there was in this case, and says, hey, we need every phone that's connected to this tower from this time to this time or towers if they're targeting multiple. Um, and what that's going to give is they're going to get a report back and they're going to see a few things on there. They're going to be able to see the serial number of the device, the SIM number of, well, not always the serial number, but definitely the SIM card number. It depends on if you're using a GSM network or a CDMA, which I won't get into that right now, but, um, They'll see the SIM card number, uh, and uh, they'll see the strength of the device, like how good of a signal connection it has. Essentially, they're asking for the 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 starting report to build a cast report, but they're asking for every phone that was connected to it. Why so many states have pushed back and fought against this, including the ACLU? You know, the ACLU came out and was like, this needs to stop because um, you're asking for all this data and you're looking for one person or a couple people. But we have examples here of a robbery that happened um, where you pulled 1,200 people's phone data to get a few people. Well, where is all that other data from those other phones? And how do we know that these police officers are securing it? Hmm. You know what I mean? We're the owners of our data. We are the owners of our data. I know that's debated. I get it. And there's a fine line between what is vague enough to not identify somebody versus what's too much to easily identify somebody. And that's where that argument is. Well, in Idaho, clearly, if they're doing this, uh, they don't have any laws against it. Surprise. Um, but uh, so they effectively were able to get a cell phone tower data dump here between three and five, like we just read. November 13th, 2022, between 3 a.m. and 5 a.m. So they got every phone connected to that tower between those times. Which is like the whole college. Probably. Probably. I'm assuming, okay, and I'm I'm assuming here that the tower they targeted, or maybe plural, maybe it is the two that overlap the one one two two, um, but I would think they would prioritize the Theophilus Tower. Yeah, because that's the closest, in my opinion, that would be the one that has the five G small cell tower data system, right? For uh, an ultra wide band, ultra capacity to hold a whole bunch of people and give really fast download speeds. Why that's important is because the higher the capacity or band or shorter the wave, the more reliable it is like for where someone is at at the home. You know what I mean? It's still, when I say more reliable, I mean multiple square miles reliable down to like you know, some football fields or more, or, you know, a quarter of the size of that town. So, which is not super precise. No, it is the opposite of precise. No, yeah, it's not precise at all. It's not precise at all. When, but it lets you know they're in the general area and, and of he, Moscow. Here's a really important thing to note, too, you guys, is that um, this is a college town. Okay. Do you know how many people were in that general area? You know, the Theophilus Tower and actual student living is within there. Yeah. Like, do you know how many thousands of people they, they had to go through to see what, who was in that general area? And they didn't even find Koberger. No, and they didn't find Koberger. And that's what I was going to get to here to read the rest of it. So let's let's read the rest of this and oh, dig into sorry. it. Sorry, right? I, I so, jumped ahead. Sorry. <laughs> I'll start from the beginning. As part of this investigation, law enforcement obtained search warrants to determine cellular devices that utilize cellular towers in close proximity to the King Road residence on November 13th, 2022, between 3 a.m. and 5 a.m. Important part. After determining 
that Koberger was associated to both the 2015 White Elantra and the 8458 phone. Investigators reviewed these search warrant returns. A quarry of the 8458 phone in these returns did not show the 8458 phone utilizing cellular tower resources in close proximity to the King Road residence between 3 a.m. and 5 a.m. So, couple questions here. All right. The way this is worded, I think it is intentionally confusing. Right? Yep. Because why would you make it seem like you're hot on the trail of somebody that owns a 2015 White Elantra and owns an 8458 phone, but in doing so, you decided to submit a request for a tower cell tower data dump for hundreds or thousands of cell phones that are in the general area. A cell phone tower data dump is what you do when you're in the beginning part of your investigation and you do not have a suspect. If you did have a suspect, you would be able to very easily look up their phone number, right? Because in this same exhibit A and PCA, it says in here that Due to a traffic stop where Brian Koberger shared his 8458 number, they were easily able to identify Brian Koberger tied to this 8458 number. So then, why is there a tower data dump at all? You got me. What day did they put the search warrant in? Does it say? Or did they not specify? No, it doesn't specify right here. Of I think. I not. think later... In this, it specifies, uh, and I don't remember when exactly that was, um, but it 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 leaves to the question: Why is there in this paragraph here a double negative? Right. So what I mean by that is, in one hand, they're saying we did a cell phone tower data dump. And due to the outcome of that data, we have evidence proving Koberger's the guy. It's our evidence supports he's the guy because he's not there. That's literally what it's saying. Yeah. Then that evidence supports 300 million other U.S. Americans. That's insane. Crazy. Yeah. Absolutely insane here. When you're looking at this singular piece of evidence, but you know, everybody's argument, it's the cumulative amount of uh, evidence. And what about the DNA? Yeah. My issue is that every piece of evidence, even if you want to talk about it's the abundance. You know, it's all of the things stacked together that paint the picture. But if you break down each of those and there's issues in each of them, then can you still have that same argument that it's the accumulation? Yeah. I. If each one is flawed. No, no, you can't. No, and that falls into like some of those logical fallacies that uh, I find all over this. And this is one story that I I almost dug into further, um, and uh, I ended up not. But uh, you know, it. So this is interesting, right? So they did this cell phone tower data dump, and they're saying in this PCA the fact that Brian Koberger is not found between three to five is evidence. Okay. So I started digging into this more and I came up with a realization. Do you remember seeing this map? Yep. What do you think this map is? This is the map of Brian Koberger leaving the crime scene and going down to Lewiston, making that loop back up home to Pullman. I don't believe that's what this map is. I believe this map shows the connection that they have with the cell phone towers, with the breaks 
in the cell phone towers where they lose connection. Okay. I think in all these spots, they're losing connection with his device. Okay. Now, what's interesting here is we have a blue line, right? How many times in the PCA do we hear that we see Brian Koberger for what appears to be heading towards Moscow? Yeah. Okay. So assuming they they don't have the evidence to say Brian Koberger headed to Moscow at this time. The wording is slanted in a way where I don't believe, and I've said this from the beginning off the evidence of the cell towers, watch this video, you guys, but I don't believe that there is any connection crossing that highway that connects Pullman to Moscow. Yeah, they said there wasn't. Right. So that's further evidence here. They said... He started on some road, I can't remember, and then his phone cuts off. They're talking about down here. So everywhere there's a break, I can almost guarantee you there is a break in cell phone coverage. So look at this. Yeah, that's obvious. Like That's why there is no line going to Moscow. It's obvious that is the connection, but that is the map. They're saying he traveled, that that's where he went that night. I. I understand that, but this is this is a possible route based off of cellular device location. Okay. Okay. So what's interesting is this blue line. What does that blue line mean? There is no cell coverage right here. Okay. None. So what? That's where they think he went. That's where they think he went. Correct. They're just assuming. They're assuming. I think it's really important to be able to highlight where these breaks are. I think it's equally as important to highlight that they don't talk about these breaks in coverage in the document. Wait a minute. Can, is, I, wait a minute. They're literally showing connection while he's still in Moscow. I, I thought they said he was already on the interstate, but when his phone turned on at like literally an hour later or something like that. I'm telling you, this does not make sense. It doesn't make sense because they have their red triangle here. I think this is to identify his home base. Okay. Yeah, yep. Then you have him going south here, right? Going south. Then there's a break in coverage right here. And then he continues south, a break in coverage. He continues south and southeast, break in coverage. Then he works up north break in coverage. I think this blue line could identify the possibility of him uh returning in the morning. Or do you remember in the PCA in the portion that says uh hang on here where it's important to notate that uh Further review indicated that the 8458 phone utilized cellular resources on November 13, 2022 that are consistent with 8458 phone, leaving the area of Koberger residence at approximately 9 a.m. and traveling to Moscow, Idaho. Specifically, the 8458 phone utilized cellular resources that would provide coverage to the King Road residence between 9.12 a.m. and 9.21 a.m. The 8458 phone next utilized cellular resources that are consistent with the 8458 phone traveling back to the area of the Koberger residence, arriving the area at approximately 9.32. Then after this, it says, investigators found that the 8458 phone did not connect or did connect to a cell tower that provides service to Moscow on November 14th, 2022. But investigators do not believe the 8458 phone was in Moscow on that date. The 8458 phone has not connected to any tower that provides service to Moscow since that date. 
Wait, so are they saying he returned on the 13th and the 14th? They're saying that he his phone connected to these this tower and he wasn't in Moscow. Okay. Strange. Yeah, I mean, people it's have said strange that. strange with this. I understand people have said that. But do you understand, like, how unlikely that is with this gap in coverage right here? Yeah. They're saying this cell tower that is covering the it one, covers one a two, tiny. Two it's so tiny of an area, too. Then why are they trying to correlate that it's being picked up here? This blue line is associated with this blue triangle. They're also saying that on the 14th, he connected to this tower and was not in Moscow. Yeah. Then how are they leaning on the reliability of Brian Koberger being in this area? Ever. Ever. And what's important, like why this map is important, is because this blue triangle correlates with this blue line here. So if it did this on the 14th, and he never even entered Idaho, the fact that they're highlighting that on here, that it, sh that it shows... That he connected to a cell tower that provides service to Moscow, but investig investigators do not believe he was in Moscow, shows the unreliability of this tower. Therefore, proving that there is only one tower. One. One tower. And why it's randomly connecting to phones all the way out here? I couldn't tell you. I don't know. I have no idea. It doesn't make sense. It doesn't Weird. make sense. So they're saying he returned to the 13th and the 14th? No. They're saying he connected to a tower on the 14th I know, I know. and was never there. I know, but so are they saying he did return on the 13th then? They're saying that they saw his phone connect to a tower. Yeah, I know. The There's 13th. two separate statements You're, there. Right. You're picking up what I'm saying. What they're saying is what they saw on the 13th and what they saw on the 14th is the same thing. But on the 13th, they're saying he went there. On the 14th, they're saying he didn't. That's so weird. So what's the evidence proving it? What is the evidence? Because we're looking at a gap in coverage. That's what's important here. This giant gap in coverage. Which they're trying to say is proof that he turned off his phone to avoid detection. No. I do not think that's what they're saying. I think there's a gap in coverage. Yeah, here. but Brett Payne said that his phone turned off at a certain time when they believe he was headed to Moscow. And in his experience and training, you know, individuals turn off their phones to avoid detection while they're committing a crime. No, he's saying that as a reason why he wasn't picked up on the data dump. Not to prove he was there. I think they're leaning on the whatever pictures they have of whatever uh, car they have or whatever, but the data dump doesn't support the theory. Right. So if you're an investigator, you've got to explain that, right? They don't know where Koberger is. They just know he's not there based on his phone. Well, I can tell you why there's no service here. Look, like there is a gap right outside of Moscow here. And there is a major tower right here. There is a massive gap here. Hmm. I'm going to, I'll dig into the towers again. Like I will dig into them. But when we looked into this, what's interesting is the only tower that went over here 
was the tower that was on top of the water tower. The Theophilus Tower wasn't even p pointed that direction. No, it points straight down towards 1122 correct. King Road and the campus. It doesn't go east or west at all. That's correct. It yeah. literally just points south, like straight down. That's correct. And it, it only covers like that area of that neighborhood and campus. Like that is it. It's such a small area that it covers. Correct. There, There's so many little like Easter eggs in this cell phone data statement. I, I'm telling you, almost every single one of these I have questions about. It doesn't align with my knowledge and experience of cell phone networks. It doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense. None of it. I mean, they got DNA and pictures of his car, right? They don't need it. I don't know. I mean, there that's a pretty big claim, claiming that, uh, you know, members of CAST are certified with the FBI to prevent provide expert testimony in the field of historical CSLI and are required to pass extensive training that includes both written and practical examinations prior to being certified with CAST, as well as the completion of yearly certification requirements. Additionally, the FBI CAST SA that I consulted with has over 15 years of experience. Okay, hold That's a wait, lot. Wait. That's as much as you. Wait. No, no. Wait. 15 years of experience as a federal law enforcement officer. Wait, that's what he said? Yes. He didn't say specifically in cell phones? No. Which includes six years with the FBI. It doesn't even say how many years experience with cast he has. From the information provided by CAST, I was able to determine estimated locations for the 8458 phone from November 12th, 2022 to November 13th, 2022, the time period authorized by the court. You know, it's a, you know, it's super interesting. What? You know, it's super interesting. What? So here's another thing. He just said in his statement that he pulled a cell phone tower dump, right? He he pulled that information. But here he's saying that from information provided by CAST, I was able to determine estimated locations for the 8458 phone. So who pulled this data? Who had the warrant? To pull the cell phone tower dump. Or was he given it by cast? He just says right here that cast is the reason he was able to determine estimated locations for 8458. Estimated locations. I mean, don't we have a, we have an AT&T search warrant. Yeah. There's search warrants for cell data from uh -huh. phone companies. Yeah. I need I haven't looked over them, but but I, that doesn't clarify like anything that's being talked about here. Yeah, I assume there when, has to be a warrant for the cell tower data yeah. dump. Police can't just go and get that. I know that's what I'm saying. We have warrants for well, the we, companies, but I mean I like I said, I haven't looked for... over them, but I assumed when he said that he did it with information provided by Cass, that he means they literally told him how to triangulate and that's, estimate the location. That's locations. literally what is said here. Yeah. That is what's said. I'm just trying to understand, like, who provided this information? Like, what do you mean by that? Like, are you saying Cass gave him data on Koberger's phone? Data on Cobra. No. Like, no data, the network data for Koberger's phone. That's what I'm asking. That is what is not clear here. That is what a judge, a, a, a judge should have been asking these things. Because these are, these are 
again, like a double negative situation. Okay, you got the the cell phone tower data dump and you were able to effectively like, you know, identify where Koberger was at all these times. Gotcha. Um, then later at a later time, you were getting cast reports from a cast officer with an un uh, unknown amount of experience as a cast essay, but 15 years of law enforcement experience. Tell me how that applies. I have no idea. Um, Law enforcement officers aren't like cell net et, network whatever experts. Yeah, they're I, not. I yeah. I have no idea how that applies, but whatever. I was trying to say, you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It, that doesn't make sense. You're no, right. it doesn't make any sense. The whole thing. That's what I'm saying. Like through the PCA, like this is old news. Yes, this is old news. But how many people have identified where? It feels fabricated through the whole thing. Almost almost anyone could just be like, hey, Brendan, pick that one. Tell me what doesn't make sense in that one. And I could probably find something. Like, that's how it feels. That's how unreliable it feels. It does feel that unreliable. And with the cell phone data, I just happen to know that stuff, you know? Yeah. Eat up that word salad. <laughs> but I'm curious what you guys think about it. Do you think we're on to something here? Um, something doesn't add up. It never did. I'm curious if they're going to make it add up in court. I mean, I want to know who the cast officer is. Same. I want to know how you have, uh, what was it called? A, uh, a draft or a draft cast report. Like, what does that mean? What is a draft cast report? I, I, I don't know. Does that mean you have drafted points on a map? Does that mean that this is, Hey, this, this information shouldn't be taken as truth. It's just to show you what I could give you probably maybe at some later date. Like that's terrifying. Th that's insane because I can tell you just off the map that you provided, how you do not have enough coverage to triangulate a cell phone. I can show you that. Just look at this map. All those holes are a problem. Big time. Yeah. But anyways, let me know what you guys think. We'll be talking about this on the True Crime Talk Show further. And we can go into more questions, more details, and more fun tech fun facts. Fun tech fun facts? Exactly. It'll be a good time. Yes. So one of our lovely viewers sent us this paragraph, essentially. It's a, it's a, it's a paragraph from Blaker's um, affidavit. Exhibit A, statement of Blaker. <laughs> What's his name? Dustin Blaker? I think it's Dustin Blaker. Um, yeah. I'm not I'm not scrolling all the way to the top. I don't care that much. You know who I'm talking it's about. Dusty Boo. Um, but J Ray sent us this part and said she felt like it was really important. Uh, I don't know why she felt like it was really important. Do you remember what she said about why it's important? I mean, I don't think I have it in front of I don't, I don't think, think she, she gave said. any details. She just said it was really strange. And then I read it and I was like, hmm. Interesting. That is weird. Yeah. So I'm going to read it to you and then we're going to talk about it. So this is from page. It starts on page 19 and finishes on page 20. And it's the bottom paragraph of page 19. And this is the attached Blaker affidavit to the Washington search warrant. Um, it says the King Road residence contained a significant amount of blood from the victims. And again, we're talking about Idaho four. Okay. Idaho four case, Brian Cobert. And start over. The King Road residence contained a significant amount of blood from the victims, including splatter and cast off. I should have probably gave a trigger warning. We're talking about blood. So if that's something you can't handle next time, join us, skip ahead. Um, and then in, in uh, quotations, not quotations. I can't think right now. Parentheses. It says blood stain pattern resulting from blood drops released from an object due to its motion. 
which is interesting, which, based on my training, makes it likely that this evidence was transferred to Koberger's person, clothing, or shoes. Based on the locations of the suspect vehicle and the 8458 phone immediately following the murders, it is probable that Koberger went home to his residence at 1630 or 1630 Northeast Valley Road, G201. At that time, it is likely that he still had blood or other trace evidence on his person, clothes, or shoes, including skin cells or hair from the victims or from Gonzalez's dog. It is likely that some trace evidence was transferred to areas in his apartment through contact with items worn during the attack. One likely location for the clothes, mask, shoes that he was wearing during the attack would be his residence. While I believe Koberger is visiting family in Pennsylvania over the current school break at WSU, I believe he intends to return for the start of the next semester, so I expect his belongings to still be in his residence at 1630 Northeast Valley Road, G201. Okay, first thing. It said there was splatter and cast off. And this bloodstain pattern is blood drops released from an object due to its motion, right? Mm -hmm. So what does that mean exactly? Well, when we're looking at cast off, uh, it's when an object is swung in an arc and flings blood onto nearby surfaces. This occurs when an assailant swings the bloodstained object be back before inflicting another blow. Analysts can tell the direction of the impacting object by the shape of the splatter. Tails point in the direction of the motion. Counting the arcs can also show the minimum number of blows delivered. Yes, it can. Blood splatter can tell a lot. It, All you Dexter fans would know this. Yes. So it can tell a lot. They can also determine even like the speed and force. Absolutely. Like they can tell a they lot. They can tell the height of the suspect. They can tell the uh, what, what uh, position the suspect and victim's body was at the time of that swing. Um what else? They can tell a lot, like a lot. They can. So they can measure the width and length of the stain. The angle of impact can be calculated. They can, they can calculate a ton from it, um, which is interesting. I'm super curious where they were seeing cast off and why they believe it'd be on his. I mean, I think all of us know there is absolutely no way whoever did this didn't get blood on them. I think it's yeah. an impossibility. It it's is. not even possible. And the fact that they're highlighting his shoes and there's no apparent blood trail. They only mention a single latent shoe print. Well, and remember when we talked about the Pennsylvania warrants uh, a few days ago, they specifically said that they were searching his car for his gas pedal and his brake pedal because there's some, there must have been some kind of reason they believed there was blood. On his shoes. On his shoes, which would have then transferred over to the pedals, yes. And they, they also <clears throat> had to have mentioned that latent shoe print for a reason in the PCA. Yeah. What does that mean? Like, how can they believe he was in and out of there that fast, but also there was a latent shoe print that wasn't visible to the naked eye? It, Literally indicating it had to have been cleaned up. Or are they suggesting it had worn off enough that, I mean, then why wouldn't they mention a trail of footsteps? And remember the diamond pattern. They're looking for a diamond pattern. And they didn't reason, find it. For a reason. Yeah, and they didn't find it. No, they didn't find it in Brian Koberger's residence. No. Mm -mm. Really, really, really interesting. So... I mean, and Brian Koberger didn't wear van style diamond pa pattern shoes uh, from any pictures or background that we can see. But, uh, you know, would a criminal be smart enough to use different shoes? I mean, 
that's what I would have done. Mm-hmm. And I'm not trying to suggest his guilt here. I'm just trying to give uh, real life plausible situations, right? Yep. Yeah, they can. There's so much they can tell from the blood splatter. And then I started thinking, okay, so we know that they could probably determine, like, okay, this person had to have blood on them. They had to have been standing here. The victim had to be here at all these points of impact. If they fought, they could tell all of that, that there was a struggle other than just the identifying marks on the the defense wounds on the bodies, but also like the blood splatter could help determine that too. Um, where the people were when they were initially attacked. That's a big deal. But okay, so moving on from that. So we're being sold the narrative he was in and out of there in like nine minutes, right? This this timeline got more and more compressed. It went from about an hour to down to like literally nine minutes. And I know a lot of people are saying that's not impossible. Like that is possible. And I agree with you. It is possible. The issue I have is that it is impossible for him to not have blood on him. And he got in the car and sped off. Are you telling me he had enough time to kill all those people, run out to his car and disrobe and leave no trail in the home? No trail leading outside and nothing in the car. And then people say, well, he had enough time to clean up, but they detected no harsh chemicals in the car. So I started I started thinking, well, what kind of solvents are typically used? What are the most what gets rid of blood the best? Like, what is the best chemicals for getting rid of blood? What? I I don't I don't want to throw you off. Get get to a point where I can interrupt you. No, go ahead. We can cover the chemicals in a second. Um, we just covered the phone records. Okay, I can't believe I read this earlier and I didn't like connect the dots. That's very unlike me. Um, but it says in here based on the location of the suspect's vehicle and 8458 phone immediately following the murders. What do you mean? His 8458 phone was nowhere near the house immediately following the murders, at least from 3 to 5 a.m. Whoa. Yeah. Because I would not consider anything after 5 immediate. Yeah. And they don't even mention him taking that loop. Blaker literally says he would have went home and likely had the blood still on him. Yeah. Yeah, I know. I was going to bring that up, too. I just wanted to cover the chemicals first. but I didn't realize it until right now. But, you know, I, I read this in passing earlier because I was in the middle of research and stuff for the DNA. Um, but that's very interesting. Like... I agree. That... What? Wait. So, why does Blaker think he knows where the eight four five eight phone is immediately following the murders? When I hear immediately following the murders, that is in tandem with the car at the crime scene location. That's what that means. Mm-hmm. But the eight four five eight phone wasn't connected to any towers associated with Moscow between 3 a.m. and 5 a.m. And if he made this big old loop and didn't return home for like a a long time, then why would you say immediately? And he would like anybody who sees that route that they're alleging he took assumes he took that route to get rid of evidence. Like, duh. So why would you assume he had anything on him? Instead, he acts like it was immediate and he would for sure have something on him, which this is a search warrant. Okay, this is the exhibit affidavit attached to a Washington search warrant to get access to his apartment. So, but that clearly, clearly this evidence, clearly this statement of his is specific to his apartment to try to get access to it. 
I I hear you, and I think you're right. I agree. I think you're right. But does that justify lying. law enforcement lying? Who's lying? Is it Blaker or is it uh, Payne? Payne. Who's lying here? One of them's lying because one is saying that they know where the eight four five eight phone is between three and five a.m. That's that's literally what he's saying right here. And that he returned home immediately following well, the murders. It's, it is probable that Koberger went to his residence. So, um, I mean, that probable is important. But he's not saying it's probable we know where the 8458 phone is. He's saying based on factual, based on the locations of the suspect's vehicle and 8458 phone immediately following the murders. Dude. Immediately is one right after another. When I hear immediate, that's minutes, seconds, right after the murder. Yeah, or else you wouldn't put immediately. You just say following the murders. Right. So one of them is lying. That's not a maybe lie. This is a 100% black and white, right? With the sheath, you have Blaker and you have Payne. Okay, fine. Blaker maybe walked around the house and didn't see the sheath. That's strange. I doubt it. But okay, possible. You could sell me that story. These are two like blatantly obvious statements that contradict each other. Yeah, it's concerning. So some of the evidence is not true. Some of the evidence is fabricated. It's either Blaker or Paynes. So if we're, because Ann Taylor said in court, there is no DNA in his apartment. There is no DNA evidence in the car. Y'all found nothing. You didn't find anything. I was, and then people make the argument, well, he probably cleaned it. You know, he's, he's, um, he's a criminology student, meaning he has to know how to clean up blood, which I don't think is entirely true. He was being trained in, uh, technology, like forensics, like digital forensics. Mm -hmm. He was not being trained like, a, what are they called? A forensic technician that collects yeah. evidence clean or client crime scene cleanup. Um, yeah, I don't. Sense. I don't think he was being trained in like general forensics. He was literally focusing on technology mm -hmm. specifically. Yeah. yeah, yeah. There might be some kind of minor in that. I don't really yeah. know. But there could have been. There could have been. Um, I'm curious what his coursework was and if he ever took a class about crime scene cleanup or, you know, identifying residue of cleaning agents used in a crime scene. And I would like to look more into this. This is um, a study on basically cleaners and solvents used for cleaning up blood and how effective they are. But I haven't found anything showing is there a solvent or chemical that cleans blood and leaves no residue? It disintegrates and nobody can test for it. I'm not sure about that yet, but I'll put a picture up here. Um, and it tests it on plastic, metal, and wood. And we're looking at the yield here. Um, the ones with the lowest percentages did the best. So. It is fresh bleach, stored bleach, trigene, and sodium hypochlorite did the best and got rid of every trace of DNA. Like, the DNA could not be collected from those services. Sure, sure. That's Which interesting. Is, yeah. So... The cleaning procedures of ethanol and UV were quite inefficient but, when used alone. Uh, just to be clear, though, uh, bleach has negative effects, though, that come with it. Oh, yeah. Like, yeah. 
Yeah, you couldn't use it in your car. Like altering the colors. I think most people probably know what bleach does, right? You put bleach on any dyed surfaces or colored surface, and it's going to start uh, altering the color of those items. And it would have been obvious. Bleach leaves also leaves a residue that can be detected later. And I've still seen people use bleach, and luminol will show blood was there, but that doesn't necessarily mean they could collect DNA from it. Oh, gosh, I think we maybe would have heard that. I don't know if there was some kind of blood there, but, you know. No, I'm not saying that. No, I, I know. I know. I'm, I'm I don't believe he used loud. bleach. I'm like, thinking out loud. I believe that there was no blood in the car or the the crime or the apartment. But I'm curious, like, if somebody is savvy enough in forensics, would they know a chemical to use that they know it dissipates and disintegrates it so fast that nobody could test for it or ever see blood was there or ever see that DNA was there. So um, this discusses the results a little bit. So ethanol and UV were inefficient when used alone with DNA recoveries of up to 11 and 73%. From all services. However, the combination of both treatments was much more efficient with recoveries between 0.1 to 0.7% from three services. Moreover, fresh bleach, stored bleach, trigene, and sodium hypochlorite were very efficient in removing DNA with recoveries of 0.0 to 0.3% from all services. Um, these five decontamination strategies um, resulted in less than 1% of the DNA recovered from the surface. Um, in addition, if accepting up to 5% recovered DNA, uh, Vercon is also efficient. 5%, that's quite a bit, so that's not even important to me. Uh, for cell-contained DNA in the form of blood, the recoveries expressed in mtDNA copies... MT DNA copies and the percent of recovery relative to the no treatment controls are shown in table two. Blood, uh, as for blood, the cleaning procedures of UV and L ethanol were relatively ineffective when used alone, but they were better in combination, um, but still not great. So we're, I'm looking for bleach. Where's bleach? Uh, if it, oh. So I believe this was touch DNA. Yes, I believe that was touch DNA. I was literally reading the wrong one. <laughs> I was looking for blood. <laughs> um, so is this the right one? Okay, so this is the different services. This is blood. Uh so where is bleach and trigene? Why are they not mentioning that now? Okay, we're just going to look at the chart because that seems more simple. Uh, the efficiency of cell-contained DNA blood removal after cleaning with different treatments on plastic, metal, and wood surfaces. The table is summarizing the mean in, I'm assuming MT means mitochondrial DNA. Okay. I'm assuming because I don't see that defined right here. But anyway... Uh, and standard devi deviation per category, yeah. three to five biological replicates. The efficiency yield is expressed as the percentage of recovered mtDNA copies of the no treatment controls. So yield here, let's see which ones are best. You know, you know what's interesting about this hmm. is that on neither plastic, metal, or wood were any of these, like, okay, so plastic, metal, none of them were 0%, like they were for the touch DNA, which I think is up here. Yeah, yeah. I, I, think, I don't think touch DNA has the possibility of it absorbing into uh, any surfaces, right? Because of its, uh, how heavy it is, it's more than likely going to sit atop of it, even from... Uh, friction, you know, mm -hmm. just from uh, the friction that waves uh, static, uh, you know, mm, it'll okay. sit on top of items. 
But yeah. Interesting. It is mitochondria. Okay. It is? Mm-hmm. They use the abbreviation MT? Yep. It's mitochondrial. Okay, so this is comparing also cell-free and cell-contained DNA. Can you look up what the difference between that is? Where is it? Cell-free DNA and cell-contained DNA. Yeah, uh, I just covered this. Yeah, but I don't remember. I'm trying to remember right now because I know you did talk about it. Um, so with blood, the only cleaners that removed it completely, and for oddly enough, the only ones that are 0% are on wood, and it's Vercon and D- a DNA remover, which are brand names. And then from metal, the lowest percentage uh, was Vercon, which was 0.0 or 0.1%. Uh, but, you know, like stored bleach did pretty good at 0.4%. Fresh bleach, 0.7%. Plastic was, um, Trigene was at 0.8%, which is, oh, no. So UV and ethanol was 0.6%, which was the best one. And then Trigene is after that at 0.8. So, like, is there any cleaner you could use that doesn't cause a negative effect and doesn't leave? I think the only one that sounds like it wouldn't leave any kind of residue is, like, ethanol and UV light combined. Yeah. Because ethanol would dissipate, and I don't think you could test for it eventually, like after a few weeks or days. And there's no days. adverse effects on materials with ethanol? Well, it says ethanol mixed with UV light is more effective. Now, it wasn't the best one out of any of these. And we're, we're looking at the chart that is specifically about blood right now. Blood yeah. seems way harder to get rid of than the other chart showed which the other chart was a uh, cell-free DNA. Well, yeah, cell-free DNA is just like your uh, your trace DNA. Your that's your, what I thought it your meant. Your fingerprint DNA. Yeah, that's what I thought it meant. But I could be wrong. So correct me if we're wrong, guys. Um, I did. I did. I did see something about what it was. I just can't remember. But um, no, you're right. That's what it, it is. It is trace DNA. Yeah, cell free. Cell free DNA is any DNA that doesn't come from the center of a cell. So yes, trace okay. DNA. I mean, it could even be like embryonic. Uh, I think uh, it it would be. Uh, I think hair without the. Uh, oh, without the root. Yep. Okay. Hair without the root. Things okay. like that. Okay. So I'm just I'm. None of these percentages are impressive with the blood. I mean, except for like, like I said, the brand names Vercon and DNA remover at 0.0%. So my, it would be interesting and they don't even have the lowest percentage all together, like for all three services, which is also weird to me, like DNA remover was one of the worst on metal and plastic, but was the best on wood. Vercon, I think, is overall the best because plastic, it was 0.8% on plastic, 0.1% on metal, and zero on wood. Yeah. I mean, so I would be interested to look up that brand name and see if there's anything surrounding it that shows that it doesn't leave any kind of testable residue. Like, what chemicals are in it? Yeah, we can look that up between now and the true crime talk show that we're going to be, uh, you know, kind of digging into this and, and looking at it from that perspective. Um, but uh, still, to think that you would have a doctorate level criminology student that would be able to outsmart the FBI uh, I, that, that just doesn't feel very possible right I'm sure the, that this is not a new technique it, not 
I think. I'm 100% positive this is a new technique that people are trying to get rid of DNA uh, or cellular evidence. Um, and the FBI would be able to tell, right, in these situations. I'm sure they have countermeasure testing to be able to see if there was any uh, re regions that were used to remove DNA or cellular uh, bio whatever, you know, from a human. So, you know, what's interesting is that Skin, you, muscle, you, you, UV light worked better on DNA that was in blood than cell free DNA, trace DNA. It worked better on the blood DNA. So I wonder if you cleaned your car out really good with like the Vercon is literally the best cleaner for blood DNA. Mm -hmm. Um, if you did that and cleaned your whole car with it, and then you did a series of UV light treatments. Okay. If that would work like to where there's literally nothing, but think about know. that your whole car in your whole apartment. Yeah. I don't know. It's a lot. Mm -hmm. It seems like too much work. It seems like it's better to prevent the DNA ever getting into those areas. So I just don't think he, if, if he accomplishes and he's the guy, he didn't accomplish it by cleaning the car or the apartment. Yeah. He did it some other way. But I'm curious to know what you guys think about it. Um, the, the idea of the cleaner is really interesting to me um, because I think at some point, wouldn't you have to use some type of cleaner? Yeah. Like you would literally have to, even yeah. if you're not scrubbing like it's your whole car. literally not possible. It's just not possible. Well, I heard somebody recently claim there are cases of people who didn't transfer blood to their car or house. And I want to know that to everybody out there, if you know of a case where somebody committed a br as brutal of a crime as this and didn't no, transfer mean, any, any, crime. Any, yeah. any DNA or blood outside of the crime scene to their personal you know, property or wherever they went after, let me know, because I've, I've heard that claim with nothing backing it, and I'm curious if it ever has happened. Yeah, no, absolutely. Because it I'm, seems I'm impossible. I'm curious of it, too. I, I also some kind, saw some kind of ridiculous posting that said uh, there was some kind of police uh, report made on the night of the crime that they saw a car that had plastic sheeting halfway up their window. <laughs> what? It's so ridiculous. People so, are not going to be driving down the road and they're like, oh my gosh, did you see that car? It had plastic halfway up its window. I better call 911 now. Not happening. Yeah. So, I mean, I'll show this study in the true crime talk show and I'm going to try to find another study about like the chemicals within some of these and, um, you know, see if they leave residue and we'll talk more about it then. Um, Cause I really just, I just wanted to look at that chart for the blood DNA. That was it. Uh, cause of this particular topic. So I didn't dig too much into the whole study, but I'll read it and we'll go over it on the true crime talk show. But let me know what you guys think. If you have anything to add to this, if you know any case where no blood was ever transferred anywhere outside of the crime scene at all, or if you know about cleaners that could accomplish what Literally, the state is alleging was accomplished here. Um, let me know. All right. So we are going to be going through the three <clears throat> new Idaho 4 documents. All right. Three we're gonna, new ones. We're, we're going to read through them here, and then uh, we will talk through them for each one. So, um, hang on one sec. Let me. All right. So for number one, we have uh, state of Idaho plaintiff. First, Brian C. Koberger motion requesting clarification of the sealed order for disclosure of IgG information and protection order. Comes now, Brian C. Koberger, by and through his attorneys, 
and hereby moves this court for an order clarifying language contained in the sealed order for disclosure of IgG information and protection order filed with the court on December 29th of 2023. The court sealed order states that no individual on the family tree may be contacted by the defense or any agent of the defense without prior authorization from the court after a showing as to why such contact is necessary and material to the pre preparation of the defense. The defense, as part of the necessary work, has previously identified family members and work is being conducted. The defense does not expect to use the protected materials to identify people to contact without further order of the court. However, the defense needs to continue its investigation with witnesses and resources generated from sources outside of the protected materials without worry. The plain language of the protective order could be interpreted to prevent that work. The defense seeks clarification of the specific language of the protected order dated eighth day of February, 2024. And yes, signed by Ann Taylor. All right. So where do you think they're going with this? That they need to be able to contact people on the family tree. Yeah, but they're attacking this DNA order, right? So um, a couple things that come to mind, and I've said this from the beginning, is look, if I'm Brian Koberger, and I'm not saying that he's innocent or guilty, but if I'm Brian Koberger, and I truly am innocent, right? Like I really am innocent of this. What's the one piece of evidence I would I would have to attack? The DNA. The DNA, right? Because it's impossible that it's there or there's some other explanation for it, right? There has to be. Mm -hmm. There's no other option. Like if he's innocent, he wasn't there or there's some kind of explanation. So it's interesting to see that they're continuing this fight on the DNA evidence. Could that be interpreted as some kind of innocence or at least add to the probability of his innocence? Um, I think it's a good argument. I think it's a really good argument. And uh, I'm curious to see where it goes. I'm curious to see the angle they're going to take on this. Me too. I wonder what they're going to find. So they're digging through all of the IgG. I'm curious, have they dug through how the sample was collected? Um, Because, you know, I believe the collection of the sample and whether it's valid or not, like the validity of that sample probably matters more than anything. Because of Bicca Barlow's statement that it was partial and ambiguous. Like the actual sample. I'm curious <clears throat> if they're going to attack the actual collection of the DNA. Like, it would be really hard to prove that it was like planted or something like that. But like, I think the lab notes, like, do they have lab notes from the state lab? Like, do they, like, have they looked at that process of collection, um, you know, chain of custody, possibilities for contamination, um, the fact that it's partial and ambiguous, like in Bicca Barlow's statement? Like, is it even relevant if it's partial and ambiguous? Like, you know what I mean? Like, have they looked at the actual matching of this DNA? Uh, yeah, or what parts do match, right? Mm -hmm. Like how many were used in that? What? How many markers were used to identify him? And what's the probability in a college town that uh, the same markers could be used in this way? Right. right, right. I think that's important. I think that's really important in this situation. Because, like, even if they prove the IgG is bunk, does that prove the STR is? No. That's what I'm curious about. I, I don't... I, I wish I knew. I wish I knew. But the fact that there's still an attack on the IgG in general, um, in my opinion, that's keeping me interested in this case. That's keeping me focused because... Uh, it, 
from the very beginning, I felt like that was the biggest red flag in my opinion. And the reason for it is a couple different things, but the, the main, the big one that I have is the fact that they included Texas at all. That is such an uncommon thing to do. Why, why open up the unreliability of the chain of custody to send it to Texas when based on some of the investig investigation work that you've done, they have the ability to do these same tests in Idaho already. Oh yeah. I, I have the document actually here that, um, they, they were absolutely able to do this, um, starting several years before the crime ever happened. Um, here, this, it's this, it's, uh, Idaho state police, um, two Idaho chief sheriffs and prosecutors from Matthew Gamut ISP forensic service laboratory system director. And this is dated July 28th, 2021. This was attached to one of Ann Taylor's, uh, declarations, I believe. And this says that they were super excited to announce that we have secured a Bureau of Justice, Justice Assistance Grant to fund genetic genealogy testing and searching of unsolved Idaho cases. Mm. We are starting with unsolved homicides, essays, and missing people. So, this goes back to my original question. Were they unable to find a profile? Mm. Did they need the vacuum from Othram. Now, according to their statements, yes, ISP absolutely made an SCR profile and ran it through CODIS. That's what Bill Thompson claims. That's what he claims is that they got a partial, they got a sample, and they ran it through CODIS and didn't get a match. That's what he says. Yep. Yep. Man. I'm curious. I'm curious what I I'm curious how they're going to going to attack this IgG. Uh, I'm curious if they're just going to use the IgG as a way to prove bias. Hmm. Do you think this could be the under the underlying tone of the case is using this IgG to prove that, hey, law enforcement like skipped here and skipped there? And skip there. Oh, yeah. And here. Uh, because that would be a great argument. I did not read all this. So I've been meeting to dig into this document. And guess what I just read? What? Idaho now has a formal contract with Authorm Laboratories, a prominent leader in forensic genealogy to conduct the genealogy testing and forensic genealogy searching. ISPFS, so ISP Forensic whatever, mm -hmm. uh, is ensuring that Authorm follows accepted laboratory processes and procedures and complies with the United States DOJ interim policy on, oh. foren on FGG DNA analysis and searching. Man. Well. So instead of, it says, instead of each law enforcement agency having to ne negotiate their own contract pricing and quality control with a private lab and genealogist, IS. PFS has done all or has done that at the state level through the Idaho Department of Purchasing. And they secured federal grant funding to offer these services to local county and state agencies at no cost to local LE agencies. Interesting. And there's a team. So they formed the state genetic genealogy uh, investigation team consisting of laboratory personnel, an Idaho State Police investigator slash detective, and a representative from the Rocky Mountain Information Network to identify cases eligible for testing under this grant. Hmm. And then once they determine it's eligible, they will bring it to the local law enforcement agency and prosecutor to bring them in on the team for that case. Whoa. Interesting. Mm. So the state team is a resource for local law enforcement. Yeah, that's we're gonna, what it we're says. We're going to have to do another dive into DNA. I'm telling you, there is too much left on the table there. 
wow, I didn't realize the state had a contract. I wish I would have seen this so long ago because this, what this is attached to in Ann Taylor's, one of her declarations is from like a while back. It's from a while back. Mm. So she knew. Yeah. She knows it's Othram. This proves that. Oh yeah. There's no doubt about it being Othram. I know, yeah. but but it was only ever mentioned as speculation from news sources. And then she attached this, which means it's proven. It was Othram. They have a contract. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely, which makes a lot of the other information more plausible. Oh, the ISP didn't. <gasps> yeah. The because ISP Othram is a contract with them. They do it for them. Mm-hmm. Yep. So Shady maybe Othram did find it and they're claiming ISP found it because that's a contract. That's a contractor for yeah. ISP. Very possible. So they just claim general umbrella term ISP found it. And don't mention Othram. I mean, it's very possible. I think it's very possible. I don't. I, I think that would probably fall under a legal gray area. So, oh yeah. my gosh. Yeah. Crazy. And we'll, we'll come back to that. All right, let's move on to number two here. So in the district court, second judicial district of the state of Idaho in and for the county of Lata, Lata, <laughs> objection to defendant's motion to change venue and request for scheduling order. Of course. Right. Bill Thompson. State of Idaho versus Brian C. Koberger, defendant. Comes now the state of Idaho by and through the La Lata County prosecuting attorney and objects to defendant's motion to change venue as it is premature. This is interesting. The state requests that this court set a trial date, a briefing schedule for the defendant's motion, a hearing date for the motion to be heard, and a deadline for supporting memoranda affidavits and witness disclosures sufficiently in advance of hearing so that the parties can adequately prepare defendants motion to change venue is premature and without sufficient basis basis defendant has not provided the court with adequate information to conclude that a Lata County jury could not fairly and impartially decide defendant's case. In Idaho, a motion for change of venue is within the discretion of the trial court. State versus win, 121 Idaho. And it gives a bunch of uh, case docket numbers. Idaho's appellate court looks to several Appellate, not yeah. apple. <laughs> a appellate court. <laughs> Courts look to several factors while determining whether a court, a trial court exercised its discretion in deciding a motion to change venue, including affidavits indicating prejudice or an absence of prejudice in the community and testimony of the jurors at Vor Dyer as to whether they had formed an opinion of the defendant's guilt or innocence based upon adverse pretrial publicity. Other factors for consideration are whether a defendant challenged for any for cause any individual jurors, the nature of pretrial publicity about the case and the duration of time between the publicity and the trial itself. The Idaho Supreme Court has also explained that publicity by itself does not require a change of venue. Because publicity is not a standalone reason for a court to change venue, this court should decline to decide defendant's motion until a trial date is set and the court has heard adequate facts to enable the court to make a determination. The state respectfully requests that this court set a trial date, set a hearing date for defendant's motion to change venue, issue deadlines for supporting memoranda and affidavits, and set a deadline for witness disclosures reasonably in advance of hearing. William W. Thompson. You know what I hear here? What? So, I, I think what he's saying is reasonable because I have learned more about change of venues and typically they're not requested before a trial is scheduled. Okay. Usually it's closer to trial date. But what I hear here, he wants witnesses. He wants Correct. affidavits. He Correct. wants information. He wants to know their Correct. direction. He wants to know if they have wit alibi witnesses. He wants to know things. Correct. 
Absolutely. That's exactly what he wants to know. He's trying to find out information to see if he is going to concede to uh, the 2025 um, court date or the, the, the trial date. I think he's using this hearing to find out as much as he can. I've said that from the very beginning. From the very beginning, the prosecution seems like they are actively seeking to find the angle of the defendant, which is strange to me, you guys. It's very strange to me when the prosecution is that interested in what the defense or defendant is alleging or going to be alleging or saying or defending themselves with. Because you either have the evidence to prove that he's guilty or you don't. So what, like why that important importance is there? I, the defense doesn't have to disclose anything. Nothing, it's the thing. They are nothing. allowed to keep all of that a secret. Absolutely. They are. Absolutely. They are. <laughs> yep. They sure are. Absolutely. So, so why that's going on? I, I don't know. Um, but I will say what's interesting is that. The trial date can be changed if the location changes. Yeah. And they they want them to set the trial date before change of venue when this venue is causing the trial date to be placed in between these two dates. But if you change the venue, then those trial dates don't matter. Yeah, Ann Taylor also said she doesn't even think it could be completed in summer. Like, it would be longer yeah. than what summer even is. A absolutely. Absolutely. Which is kind of insane. A 15-week trial? That's pretty nuts. Well, if look, you have the YNW Melly case that uh, did not have good evidence, and I think cases that don't have good evidence tend to go longer. I really do. So I'm wondering, do they have good evidence, you know? I don't know. Weird. It is very strange. At least he didn't say the people of Wata deserve I agree. this trial to be here. I agree. <laughs> like he did in court. That's absurd. The whole thing was absurd. And he did not, that is, the defense did not say it was just because of media. No. They mentioned many other things. They they did. They did. And I, I don't even think they mentioned the important things. Um, based off what Ann how Ann Taylor has been managing um, the case so far, uh, I feel like she always keeps something in her back pocket because whenever there's a response, it's like she's submitting a request knowing there's going to be a response and knowing that she's actually going to give the good information in the response to that response. You know what I mean? It's really strange. Uh, it's not, I mean, it's smart. I, it's just not always common to see is what I meant to say. Um, but, uh, but yeah, it's interesting. It's interesting. I, I could see the point that you're making by wanting to set all that first. However, the big deal is, is the trial date and that trial date, uh, hinders on the vendor location or yeah. venue location. I'm sorry, <laughs> vendor venue location. Yep. So true. Number three states responses to defendants motion to allow certain experts and investigators protected access to view IgG material and motion requesting clarification of sealed order for disclosure of IgG information and protection order comes now the state of Idaho by and through the Lata County prosecuting attorney and respectfully submits the following responses to the defendant's motion to allow certain experts and investigators protected access to view IgG materials filed on February 1st, 2024. The defendant's motion requesting clarification of the sealed order for disclosure of IgG information and protection order filed on February 8th, 2024 regarding the expansion of the protected protection order to include Dr. Leah Larkin, Bicca Barlow, and Stephen Mercer. The state does not object. Nice. Regarding the expansion of the protection order to include unnamed criminal investigators, unfettered access to the IgG materials, the state objects. 
At a minimum, individuals who will have access to any of the IgG materials should be named. Further, defense has failed to make an adequate showing as to why such individuals need the information for the preparation of the defense. They don't, they shouldn't need to say why they need that. Um, Defendant states Why that the, those individuals? Yeah. Defendant states that the information is requested to investigate how and when Mr. Koberger was identified as a suspect. This information can be obtained from the TUI letter from the FBI to the state dated November 28, 2023. The state objects to the balance of the IgG materials being provided to the criminal investigators for the reasons articulated by the court in its protective order. Regarding the defense's motion requesting clarification of the sealed order for disclosure of the IgG information and protection order, the defense experts or investigators should not be allowed to use the protected materials to identify individuals or witness to contact without prior authorization from the court and after showing why such contact is necessary for the preparation of the defense. This would not prohibit the defense from contacting potential witnesses learned through sources outside of the protected information. The state respectfully submits the appropriate course of action. The appropriate course of action would be for the court to amend sealed order for disclosure of IgG information and protection order to allow Dr. Leah Larkin, Bicca Barlow, and Stephen Mercer access to the IgG materials disclosed to the defense. The criminal investigators seek access to the information should be named in the order, and those investigators should only be allowed access to the November 28, 2023 letter provided to the defense. The state also requests the following language for an amended protected order. This court orders that only defense counsel Ann Taylor, Jay Logston, and Eliza Masseth, defendant Brian Koberger, and Dr. Leah Larkin, Bicca Barler, Barlow, and Stephen Mercer may view the materials provided. Insert the names of the criminal investigators may view the November 28, 2023 letter contained within the materials. Any further dissemination of the materials or the information contained within the materials must first be approved by the court after an adequate showing by the defense as to why such information is necessary, necessary and material to the preparation of the defense. Additionally, no individual learned solely through the review of the material shall be contacted by the defense or any agent of the defense without prior authorization from the court after an adequate showing as to why such contact is necessary and material to the preparation of the defense. Respectfully submitted the 9th day of February. Interesting. I feel like that's fair. I feel like that document's fair. I do feel like it was fair, too. Yep. Uh, the TUI request, I pulled that up, yeah. What is a TUI request? Uh, named after the Supreme Court case, United States, TUI versus Reagan, 340 U.S., a TUI request seeks an official information for litigation purposes, including witnesses and documents, when the government is not party to the litigation. Hmm. When the government is not a party to the litigation. What does that mean? So, Code of Federal Regulations, sometimes referred to as the Department's TUI Regulations, named after United States um, X Rel TUI verse Reagan, uh, mm -hmm. 1951. Provide that no present or former employee of the Department of Justi Justice may testify or produce departmental records in response to subpoenas or demands of courts or other authorities issued in any state or federal proceeding without obtaining prior approval by an appropriate department official. Vargas. Um, so, what? What do you mean? So, no present or former employee of the Department of Justice may testify or produce records, okay, departmental records in response to any demands from a court 
other than authorities issued or other authorities issued in any okay without they just can't get it they can't provide it without obtaining prior approval by an appropriate department official any material contained in the files of the department any information relating to material contained in the files of the department any information acquired by an employee of the department as part of the performance of that employee's official duties or because of the employee's official status. Yep. 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 I think that could fall in line and give uh, an understanding of a couple different things, right? Oh, so Look. there was amendments made in the 1980s that decentralized the authorization power and established different procedures to be followed in cases in which the United States is and those cases in which the United States is not a party. Additionally, alternate procedural steps are sometimes involved where the originating component is or is not litigating division of the department. A denial policy generally applicable to both situations exists. Okay. It it makes me question right off the top that we heard that they didn't want to produce any background work, right? It's of a how way they got to this. So we've asked why did the FBI step up and, and grab all the IgG information based off of what we've heard happened? Okay. Is this why? Is this why? As soon as th they took ownership. Of this information, it falls under this. As soon as the FBI did. Correct. Meaning they didn't have to, because of this, It th that's exactly Correct. what this is. It protects the government from having to turn over things they don't want to turn exactly. over. Exactly. Exactly. Um, so it literally says that. It literally says that. It, it says that word for word. I know. I know. That's what I just said. What is a TUI request? So the original originating component is the office or agency or division or bureau that was responsible for the collection, assembly, or other preparation of the materials demanded. Correct. Which is why the FBI had to come take lead in the IgG. I'm telling you, dude, there is something going on with Texas. With Othram is what I'm saying. So they Othram started all of this, but they didn't finish it. Why? Why? They simply are intended to provide a procedure whereby the department will have the opportunity to protect certain types of information from unwarranted and unconsidered disclosure. Mm. Specific questions should be referred to the appropriate litigating division of the apartment. Yeah. Or, or department. And the fact that they have a TUI request proves just that. They wanted to protect it. Correct. Yeah. So did the FBI even do any of the work? No, obviously. They just took it over Correct. so that nobody would have to show their work. Correct. That's so shady. It feels like Bill Thompson's got some FBI agents in his back pocket. It could be. I don't know. Because what about Vargas? I, I've said that too. And but this makes me think: has has Vargas done work for the FBI before? And that's Probably. the real reason. Probably that the FBI came and was like, "Hey, you you're not allowed to speak." That's what we theorized the other night. Was oh, the Tui. Correct. She's not allowed correct. to. When she said, "I know that they go correct. against they." violate these that's rules correct. Yep. and she's talking on what they're doing that's wrong they're like you're not allowed to disclose that you're under these policies you're an agent for correct. the fbi yeah you are not allowed or whatever a contractor whatever yep. you're under this rule so you're not allowed to talk on this look a lot of people wondered if vargas and i i mean i brought up the question too you know so i can be guilty for <laughs> making people wonder but they've wondered if Vargas going on truth and transparency like discredited her. And I did bring up that theory because I think it's a good question. I think it's a valid question, right? Because you look biased um, just by making any comments or, or anything like that and siding with content creators that very avidly believe he's innocent, you know, or I but, mean, or are questioning hardcore, like are questioning yeah. the police and the, yeah. the state. Right, 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 right. Um, but 
I think this is very likely why the FBI went to her house. Okay. Yep. And it could be very scary being like, Hey, look, dude, you need to understand the implications of your actions here. You know, you went to court and you worked for for us. You know, you were subcontracted for us and you did work on this case, this case, and this case. So Vargas you know, is literally known as one of the best in her particular field. Yeah, I'm I'm sure she is. I'm I'm so that makes I'm not sense. Doubting. Yeah. That makes sense. She would have worked for the FBI, is all I'm saying. I'm I'm telling you, she she is uh incredible, and I think that's why she was paneled up with three other really incredible leading uh yep. DNA experts, you know. Um, and I think it's very likely the FBI was like, yo, we own you. <laughs> you can't say anything, you know. And I wonder if she went on truth and transparency as a screw you. I wonder. Oh, was like, OK, I'll work around it. We'll see. That would be very, very you know in what I mean? interesting. It would be, but it would also be smart. Yeah. So, but. uh Interesting stuff here, you guys. Hopefully, I'm going to be able to break these up into three and put out, you know, shorter versions of them also. Um, what do you think about that last one? We we dug kind of into the TUI request. I think what they're asking for is really fair, though. I think that, uh, you know, with how many names could potentially be involved in this IgG information, I don't think it's wrong that they expect to have every investigator named. You know what I mean? Be, and, and I could see this being there to control a leak. Yeah. So I understand it. I support it. I get it. Uh, but I I do think with uh I do think with uh how widely known and respected Ann Taylor's investigative team is, though, they should have access to this. Agreed. I really think so. They're professionals, you know, and they're used nationally. So I agree with you, but let me know what you guys think. And that is it for this story. Let me know your comments. So moving on to a totally new case we haven't covered before. Yeah. This is taking place in Anchorage, Alaska. And this is the a, a terrible case. Honestly, it's absolutely horrible. Um it's horrible. <laughs> I just hearing what this man did and how he's trying to like take it all back and say no it wasn't me. It's just despicable. And I have some serious questions around some of this, some of the information within this case. So this is uh, the trial of Brian Stephen Smith. And he is originally from South Africa, moved to Anchorage, Alaska, and he got married and was living with, you know, his wife and his cat, but seemingly had, um, some kind of racist thoughts like what? looking back at his quora questions and questions he asked on quora there's a bit of racism in there and he also was a youtuber posting traveling videos um and videos with his wife and i thought that was interesting because i don't hear a lot of people mentioning that he was a youtuber um, he may not have had a huge following. I actually don't know what his following was because nobody really mentions it. Um, I only saw a couple videos of his from when he had a YouTube channel. Um, but that's, I feel like highlighting the fact that he had a YouTube channel is going to be relevant once we go over the story. So, uh, going back to the beginning of this. There was a woman um, who, here, what's her name right here? Her name should be right here. Uh, why is it just saying a witness? 
Oh, Valerie Castler. So she goes on a date with Brian. Okay. A date. Okay. A date. Is she still married? Yep. Okay. Because it's not an actual date. It's sure. like, you know, paying yep. 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 money exchange. Okay. Yep. I mean, it, they're, um, they're called dates, but yeah. 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 <laughs> Whatever. Um, so she goes with him and they're riding around apparently drinking in his black truck. Uh, she's drinking flavored vodka out of a Gatorade bottle after he picks her up. Um, in cool. September, 2019, they're just riding around drinking flavored vodka. Um, so they went to stopped at a gas station and he went to get uh, money out of the ATM for her. And so she's, was homeless, okay, which is relevant because the women that were harmed in this story were also having troubles like that. Um, okay. And were indigenous women, too. I swear, so, man. Indigenous women from, like, the northern territories like Idaho and Alaska are, like... Targeted. Yeah, there's not enough attention on it in the statistics around how many percentage of indigenous women go missing and not only go missing, but don't get the proper help from authorities is so sad, dude. It's disgusting. I agree. It's a problem. Um, but this case has brought some attention to that issue, uh, which is is good, even though it's sad. You know, that this had to happen to these women. Um, but anyway, she's left in the truck. And she, I guess, decides to snoop. She's homeless. She's like, I'm going to steal whatever I can steal, you know? <laughs> and she finds, finds an SD card in his glove box. And it's got a label on it that says, Homicide at Midtown Marriott. Shut up. <laughs> Yeah. What that an idiot. Literal? That literal. What an idiot. Thank God he was an idiot. Um, because what was on this SD card was horrific. I mean, like, did she live to oh yeah. He yep. So originally she told investigators that she literally just found it on the sidewalk. And then she later confessed. She was like, actually, I was on a date. And uh, uh, she, I guess she didn't want to get in trouble for stealing and prostituting. But she was like, I was on a date and, I, you know, I stole it out of his glove box. But obviously that didn't matter once they found what was on it. Yeah, um, normally they, they're they not going to. Yeah, she don't. Do. Right. So. Anyway. um. She watched the videos that were on it, and there were, in total, 39 images and 12 videos. Um, the images and videos were of a woman lying on a floor, um, undressed, unclothed, to a bed, next to a bed, and her left eye was swollen shut. She had red marks around her neck, um, like... From a piece of cord, a ligature of some kind. Um, and he was slapping her around, posing her in different ways, um, saying really awful things to her. Um, and you know what's crazy is that Castler, the woman who found this, literally knew her, but because she was so disfigured, figured, she didn't even know it was her. Mm. She couldn't recognize this woman in the video. Um, she considered her a friend, like knew her. Um, like I said, yeah, that's really sad. These women were homeless and uh, prostituting. So, I mean, homeless people a lot of times are pretty connected to other, like the community. Yeah, they are. Um, so, one thing is that the defense in this case is trying to throw out the video saying that. Uh, this woman stole it and could have edited it or altered it. And the judge was like, heck no, it stays in. 
And she also testified and said she laughed when they asked her if she owns any video editing software. Because this woman, Valerie, testified on the stand to all of this uh, recently, this past week. And uh, she laughed and was like, no, I was homeless. <laughs> like, you know, I lived in a tent. <laughs> yeah. Like, no, I didn't edit it. Which is kind of funny. Um, but... I mean, you gotta ask, though. Yeah, no, it was important for them to ask. That's absolutely, absolutely. So, um, furthermore, uh, you know, some of the things that he said in this video were, everyone in my movies dies. And, uh, in, or in my movies, everyone dies. Um, he also said, you know, like people need to realize when they're being serial killed and what would my followers think of me? They would think you're a nut job. An absolute nut job. Um, you know, he was literally holding the recording device in one hand while strangling this woman, stomping on her neck, telling her to die. Like it's one of the most horrific. It's like, it's like a, it's straight up a snuff film. Yeah. And him saying, what would my followers think of me? I, that stuck with me. I was thinking, okay, he has a YouTube channel. So is he asking that in some weird way? Like, Oh, what would they think of me if they saw this? Or does he not only make YouTube videos, but does he make snuff films and sell them online or post them to the dark web somewhere? Is he re not referring to YouTube followers? How many more of these films are out there? If he's doing this, I assume he's killed like this before. Yeah, I mean... And his wife said he has lots of SD cards. She said she's never seen them labeled in this manner. And the fact that he had it labeled like that makes me even feel more so like it was a snuff film and that was the title he was going to put on it. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. It's very possible. So does he have some like dark underground market for snuff films? You know how many people go missing in Alaska? A lot. So. Look, if I feel weird putting this out there, but I feel like a, an analytical person would be able to figure this out anyways, right? So if I was a serial ender, right, mm -hmm. and I don't want to get caught and get given the death penalty or go to jail for the rest of my life, where am I going to go? I'm going to look for the highest missing person area and i'm gonna live there because that serial ending is the most important thing in my life like most of them right um so that gives you cover right for probably an extra one person here another person here three a year four a year uh you know and like, like idaho yeah <sighs> but alaska's Way higher, like yeah. way higher, way, 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 way higher. Yeah, there is no other state that comes even within 25% of Alaska's missing persons. That's crazy. It is. It's, and most people think it's due to the severity of the weather there. And maybe it is, but maybe it's a hotbed for these things too. Maybe. If I'm thinking of it, and I'm not a serial ender, then come on now, you know? Mm-hmm. You know what's funny is his wife was the former administrative officer of U.S. Immigration and Naturalization Service in Anchorage. Mm -hmm. Did he meet her while he was immigrating? That's strange. Is that why he married her or something? He moved to Anchorage, Alaska, needed a cover, so he married the first woman he met that he could tolerate, 
and it happened to be somebody who was helping him get his immigration status or something and then like literally moved there to kill people could be where does it say where he's originally from south africa south africa got it so south apparently south africa is notoriously racist yeah mm -hmm. they are so when he got when the cops got this sd card they initially thought it was an english accent and then apparently they recognized the voice as his because they were investigating him for a totally separate matter and we don't know what it is the police have never said what it was no way yep they recognized the voice you know what i bet it was an assault of a sexual nature and uh they didn't want this girl's information to get out there hmm. since they got him on this then why humiliate somebody you know right what I mean? yeah i don't know so it's possible yeah so then, um, so September is when they got a hold of the SD card, and then October 2019, uh, they respond to a call um, on a highway, and they find human remains, which ends up being this woman from the tape, and her name is Kathleen J. Henry. Uh, she's an indigenous woman. Um, and she was trying to get her life straight, actually. She had got her GD, was trying to make progress towards getting it together. Um, it There's a few quotes from her Facebook page, like, I'm a tough Alaska chick since 1997 until present. That was her final Facebook post. I bet people in Alaska are pretty tough. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I couldn't last. No, I I would die in Alaska. <laughs> um, it's really sad that she was trying to get it together and couldn't because of this guy. Yeah, it's very sad. It's yeah. very sad that situations like this go on. Um it's sad that we have places that provide cover for people like this. Um, it's sad that he only got caught by a random chance encounter yep. where she just so happened to search in his glove box and just so happened to see that, you know? Yep. So, um... Anyway, you know, they apparently arrest him at an airport, okay? They arrest him at an airport. Uh, he, he considers himself self-employed. He had served in the army once. Um, again, it, it... Well, you know how Alaska works, right? They pay people monthly. To come live there? Huh? Alaska, you get paid monthly if you live there. No way. Yep. I didn't know that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What, because they want people living there? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes, indeed. What? That's weird. I didn't know Otherwise, that. Otherwise, there's no benefit to live there. <laughs> so, I'm, I'm not even going to read this because... It, He's racist. There's Facebook posts and other things indicating he is a racist. Yeah. Um, it's not even worth reading. No, that. it's not worth reading. I, I don't even want to talk about that. But it's interesting that his victims, his chosen victims, are native women. Yeah. So the police pull him in, okay? They start questioning him. And um, they get him to confess basically and he he then confesses to another woman's murder and this other woman is veronica abochuk abochuk uh, yeah maybe <laughs> so 
he said that he had killed her prior. He had shot her. Okay. And then he pointed them in the direction of her remains. And they and he t- Yeah, and they told... He literally stopped and told them, I'm going to make you guys famous to the investigators. Whoa. How, what a sicko, right? Yeah. So, now, okay, that he's caught... And he's done That's for. They have serial killer behavior. By the yeah. way, is that uh, ego? The ego and wanting and, recognition. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, for sure it is. You know, I actually listened to this woman. I can't remember her name right now. I really wish I could remember her name. Um, she said, "Oh, I think it was on True Crime Daily, one of their podcasts, the one with the woman." She talked about this case recently and she had an expert on and the lady said, you know, we would go into jails and prisons or prisons and try to get like serial killers talking. And but we couldn't offer them like better food or a shorter sentence. Like she's like, we literally had nothing to offer them. She's like, we couldn't. So how did we get them talking? Appealing to their ego. Like you were so smart. What you did was so incredible. You know, how did you do it? How did you fool us? And she said it worked. So like literally all the time. (laughs) Yeah. That's so dumb. Yeah. Like how can serial killers have a higher IQ, but then allow themselves to be manipulated that easily based off their ego? It's, It's all people. All people have short comings you know yeah but um you know now like it's been years it's been years covid there was a delay because of covid and this trial um and then and several other things and the defense was trying to get this tape and the confession thrown out of court The judge well, declared no on the tape. I'm actually not sure if he declared no on the confession. I'm guessing not. Um, I mean, it doesn't matter. You pointed him in the same direction where the body was found. So, okay, throw it out. Like, this is another one of those situations was- that we just l- looked at. What What was the other case where, uh, uh, what's his face? Who, who ended his three boys? Um, Oh, Chad Doerman? Yeah, Doerman. Like, okay, you want to throw out the confession that was made at the police station? Uh, Go ahead, because 30 minutes earlier, you made another one that was very similar. Right, right. Exactly. But yeah. You know, his his wife literally says that she she doesn't, she said she didn't think he did it. Even after all of this, she said she didn't think that he did it. Well, like surprise. She's going to hear that audio from that video because the the defense also wanted once this would be played in court that they seal off the courtroom and not let anybody hear it. And the judge was like, no, <laughs> everybody gets to hear it. And Whoa. yeah. And um but obviously they're not going to let people see it. I, I only the jury, Good. only okay. the jury. Like, I don't think they're going to show that to the public or anything. This trial is being live streamed and it's currently, it, it's already started. Um, if you're a jury member, I wonder if you can ask not to watch it. No, that was one of the prerequisites when they were doing the jury selection. Then I would have been said, picked because I don't need to watch it. That one of the prere- prerequisites for the jury was that they had to be able to handle watching this because of how graphic and horrible it is. And they said, uh, and you have to still be able to remain impartial. Not possible. I mean, it's his voice. He has a yeah. distinct South African. What is it called? Accent. Mm-hmm. He's a very distinct voice. Yep. Yeah. I wonder if they're gonna they're gonna have audio analysis from his other recordings, like from his YouTube, and compare it to his snuff film. 
I mean, that would be smart if there's any question whether he's guilty or not. Well, he literally pointed them in the direction of a body. Like, come on. But I I feel like the trial is just a way for him to get more attention. Yeah, for sure. That's all it is. Like, he confessed. He The video was found. Like, it's pretty clear this man is guilty and just wants attention. Yeah. They... I... I really believe this man has to be guilty for other crimes. Well, yeah, for he sure. He has to be. Yeah. And I wonder how many there are. Like, I mean, any expert that watches that footage that's an expert in uh, serial killer uh, psychology or um, that uh, in psychology in general uh, would be able to watch the video and know whether they were watching a first or not. A first is very specific uh, and it, it really affects the serial ist um, seriously. You know, they, they have a, they have a really big emotional reaction to that crime that they commit, you know, they get a mm-hmm. huge rush of uncontrollable endorphins and, um, and have a hard time controlling it. Some people laugh like, you know, outrageously just for what's her face. The, the first woman or Canadian get, uh, arou- serial arou- killer. Yeah. yeah Elizabeth or- Weddlehofer mm-hmm. or something like that, or they get aroused or, There's many different things that can happen, yeah. But this trial is scheduled to last three to four weeks. I believe we're only in week one, I think. We already had, you know, the witness that stole the memory card. Um, Oh, no. We're probably going into week two now, actually. Yeah. Um, So... I mean, they already played some of the stuff, you know, some of the videos and pictures and stuff. And um, clearly he's going to be convicted. But I thought it was curious. And I'm I'm. If he was making snuff films, is this another like Gilgo situation where there could possibly be a ring? I have no clue. It's a good question because but if- it's worth looking and I mean, continuing to watch and paying attention for advocates that go in there and talk to serial killers to try and find out if they have more victims. You know what I mean? You know, one thing that I really liked was that within the court proceedings, there's, um, you know, the red hand print that's uh, for the native Alaskan and native ad- indigenous women. Mm-hmm. Um, because of this issue, there was a bunch of them in the uh, gallery in the courtroom with that red hand print over their faces all sitting there. Mm. Um, they're trying to bring awareness to this issue because it is a major, major problem in Canada and Northern America Alaska, you know, northern yeah. United States. I mean, it's a it's a really big problem. Um, and it even though it has got more attention in the past few years, it hasn't gotten enough. No. It has there hasn't been enough change yet. Um so I think it's important, you know, to highlight it. Yeah. Yep. I agree. You know, in Oregon, there was that native woman and uh, that they thought was connected to those other bodies, but she, it's probably not um, with the Jesse Calhoun thing. Oh, yeah. 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 It happens qu- pretty frequently and uh, they aren't investigated well enough. I'm glad this guy is caught, though. I'm glad he was caught. The whole innocent till proven guilty thing. I get it, but there's literally video evidence <laughs> and a confession. So, yep. Anyway, let me know what you guys think of this case. If there's any aspects to it you want me to dive deeper into, um, any other cases in the area that you feel like could be connected. Um, I found his comments about followers just really weird and odd. So, let me know what you think, and that's it. All right. And that is it for Thought Riot Podcast. Episode number three zero thirty, right? Yeah, we're middle aged. Right, we're middle aged. Yeah, absolutely. Is that middle aged? I think forties is middle aged, actually. Okay, I don't know. 
I guess <laughs> it, you're middle aged if you only live till sixty. But anyways, if you made it this far, we appreciate you. And make sure you do all the podcast things. Like I said in the beginning, uh, just giving a like, you know, it, it it's free. It takes uh, a fraction of a second. A or fraction of a second. A review just saying, love you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You're or great. Or a comment. Just saying hi. And some a lot of our viewers do that. So uh, that's really nice. And we appreciate that. For all of you that don't do that, if you have a second, if you have a half of a second or a quarter of a second, do that because it helps us out a lot. Like a lot. I can't emphasize how much it helps us out, you guys. Um, so uh, please do that. Please if, hook us up with a like and a comment. And, if you uh, want let us to keep family know. Yeah. If you want us to keep hooking you up with the content, you yes. know? Yes. Yes. So, uh, but that is it. And make sure you check out all of our social media, which is forward slash thought right podcast, except for Twitter. It is forward slash thought right pod. Um, but, uh, we appreciate all you being here with us tonight and hopefully you enjoyed the show. We were a little heavy in the Idaho four stuff, but like, gosh, there was just a lot of different topics that came up over the past week. So you um, were heavy. <laughs> yeah. 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 But, uh, I just totally spit everywhere. I don't know why, <laughs> but yeah, that's a great way to end the show. Uh, <laughs> spit fireworks. <laughs> all right, Wonderful. you guys. Thought Right Podcast, and we are out.